Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace be upon you. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. First and foremost, pray our, praise our gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has protect and provide us with health so that today we can meet and carry out with this program. Salawat and salam to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the last messenger. Certainly, there is no apostle after him, our role model and our guide to all mortal, to all noble morals. Following his attitudes and behaviors in every day, will not only bring benefits to our personal life, but will also bring this country to become baldatun, toyibatun, warabun wafur. I mean. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your enthusiasm on this on this second day our program. Hopefully, all of you can keep your spirits up until the end. Thank you. Okay, before continuing, please let me introduce myself. My name is Salma Malida, and today I will be your master of ceremony, and I will guide you all during the lecture. Please be kind upon me as you will find, find many mistakes mistake from me. Thank you. We would like to thank all parties who have helped this event to be held, especially to our sponsors, Basnas, Las Albundian and BPRS Botani, and Prudential Sharia. Prudential Sharia is the market leader of Sharia life insurance industry and the first joint venture company to have spin off. Prudential Sharia, make it true. To your heart. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our first lecturer for today's agenda has already been here. And please welcome Dr. Muhammad Ubaidullah. Um, Assalamualaikum, doctor. How are you? Walaikum salam, sister. I'm fine. Is that good? Oh, inshallah. Where are you at now, doctor? Uh, I'm in Jakarta. Oh, so you're in Indonesia. Mashallah, mashallah. <laughs> okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, for this session, Dr. Muhammad Ubaidullah will share with us about digitalization in Islamic social finance toward Islamic green economy. Okay, uh, before that, I will introduce our lecturer. So, Dr. Muhammad Ubaidullah, our second lecturer is the lead research economic at Islamic Research and Training Institute, IR. CI of the Islamic Development Bank Group, ISDP. According to his, his LinkedIn account, he has served several international and national institutions of repute, creating and sharing knowledge in field of Islamic economics and finance. And he is the author of the popular book Islamic, Finan Islamic Financial Services. He has specifications, specific, special I'm sorry, he has specialization in finance and certifications in microfinance, blockchain, technology, digital money, fintech, and related areas. Among other things, he is the founder of IBFNet, the Islamic Business and Finance Network, and its flagship initiative, the International Institute of Islamic Business and Finance. Okay, so he is so amazing, isn't he? I believe you all must be impatient to listen to his lecture now. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, before we continuing, we would like to inform oh, all of Sorry, can you please mute? Okay, sorry, I will continuing. Okay, before we continue, we would like to inform all the participants that after the lecture is finished, you will be given the opportunity to ask questions to the lecturer. If anyone want to ask Dr. Muhammad Ubaidullah, you can use the raise hand feature on the Zoom or you, or you can write down the question on the chat Zoom. Okay, without any further ado, let's begin our first lecture by Dr. Muhammad Ubaidullah. Okay, time and screen is yours, sir. Uh, thank you, Ibu Salma. Uh, respected uh, professors and scholars from IPB University, Faculty of Islamic Economics, uh, and from uh, scholars from Baznas and uh, uh, participants of this winter course in Islamic Economics. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
Uh, today's uh, presentation, uh, I am uh, planning to uh, speak on or uh, present my uh, thoughts on digitalization of uh, Islamic social finance, as we understand, and how it uh, contributes to the uh, Islamic green economy, as we understand. Uh, so uh, allow me a couple of seconds to upload my presentation. Okay, so uh, uh, before I start, uh, let me very briefly uh, share with you my plan of presentation. Uh, to start with, I'll be uh, uh, sharing with you uh, on green economy as a societal goal, as a policy goal uh, across all nations, across all countries and regions. Uh, environmental uh, action or climate action or what we call the move towards green economy. That undoubtedly is a very important policy goal. All nations are striving to achieve the targets based on their own consensus among the policymakers, which we generally know as the sustainable development goals, uh, which have been uh, you know, uh, agreed upon after sustained deliberations among different nations, among their policymakers. And uh, uh, we, we start with that, and then we, we move on to Sharia perspectives on the idea of this green economy, the idea of climate action, the, and the idea of environmental action, and how green economy can itself be a policy goal in Islamic societies. What does Sharia has to say on uh, this as a goal? Then we will take uh, uh, undertake an overview of uh, various emerging technologies. Uh, we will be focusing primarily on blockchain technology. And of course, we have artificial intelligence that is a, a massive use of this technology now uh, for achieving this various developmental objectives. And as we said, as we like to put it, that uh, uh, how these technologies serve for good, for the good of the society, for the development of the economies, to what extent and how they, they can contribute. So we'll have a very uh, uh, brief overview of uh, primarily the blockchain technology for good. And then we will move on to technology as a driver for a green economy. We'll discuss a few use cases where uh, the blockchain technology and AI and other emerging technologies are currently being used by different organizations, by different institutions for uh, moving towards these goals of green economy or a green planet. So we'll discuss some very relevant, uh, very quickly, some use cases, uh, just to get a feel of how uh, different institutions, organizations at various levels have been trying to, have been striving to apply these technologies as we call them web 3.0 technologies for achieving this uh, you know for achieving uh, a green economy and then we move on to islamic social finance in, uh, uh, you know to be very specific we'll narrow it down our the scope of our discussion to the tools or the institutions of islamic social finance as we understand we will talk about zakat we'll talk about awqaf and we will talk about uh, other, uh, you know, uh, ways of defining Islamic social finance, as we understand, this is an evolving discipline by itself. And uh, we will see what are the tools and how they can be digitalized. We will both look at the potential as also what is currently being done, undertaken by different uh, stakeholders. And uh, again, we will uh, narrow it down to the those tools or those experiments, which primarily focus on climate action and green economy. And finally, we'll take a specific use case for, uh, for, for more 
uh, you know, I would say uh, for, for a closer look and for discussion uh, at, a, at a more, uh, at a narrower level to see how alternative ways of uh, digitalizations uh, are there and uh, what are the pros and cons of uh, uh, a kind of comparative analysis of uh, two different use cases. And uh, so this will give you a, a, a better uh, grasp over uh, what could be the uh, you know, considerations that go into such decisions. So it's not that we just use technology for the sake of technology, for the sake of uh, uh, you know, appearing to be what I call progressive user of technology, but they must serve a common good. They must bring some tangible benefits. They must be seen to, uh, you know, uh, address certain tensions, certain pain points in the economy and uh, the various segments, various participants in the economy. Okay. Now to start with the first part of our presentation, uh, which is green economy as a societal goal, as a policy goal. Just to take you briefly uh, through these uh, ideas because they are very, very relevant for uh, you know, our uh, topic at hand, which is uh, the dig uh, digitalization of Islamic social finance for a green economy. So let's see where green economy stands as a policy goal. We just discussed that the sustainable development goals, they reflect the kind of consensus among the global community of policymakers. And uh, some of the major challenges confronting the humanity, they are captured and they are sought to be addressed by the SDG framework. And it's this framework that basically sets the direction in which all resources will be channelized over the next are uh, very, very clear targets uh, to be achieved by the year 2030. Now, as we know, uh, some of you may be pretty aware of this framework because it is continuously under focus at all levels, at all scholarly deliberations and discussions. They were formulated, adopted in the year 2015 for the next 15 years, and they include 17 sustainable development goals. Basically, you can say they, they, they reflect a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity of the people and the planet now and into the future. And though we see them as 17 different goals, but they are all very, very interdependent, quite broad based, and they quite they overlap a lot uh, amongst themselves, but they suddenly set a direction. So what are these SDG 17 goals? Uh, you can see uh, where the idea of green economy appears. And uh, uh, we have certain, uh, you know, basically if we see these 17 goals, uh, you know, targeting the protection of the people and the planet. If you compare that with the Millennium Development Goals, uh, which were, uh, you know, formulated and agreed upon at the turn of the century, uh, these goals were more focused on the, on the, on the people. And with time, uh, you know, uh, planet Earth has, or the people living on the planet, they have learned to focus more on the planet itself. And the idea of environmental protection and climate action is now very much on the front, front burner of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the global policymakers. So we can see that, you know, uh, the ideas that directly relate to the green economy, the idea of sustainable cities and communities, the idea of sustainability itself, which means looking into the future or taking care of the future. That is where the idea, the notion of sustainability comes in. Whenever we are not talking about the, uh, the present or now, we are talking about the future, we talk about sustainability. So we talk about clean water sanitation. We talk about sustainable cities and communities. We talk about responsible consumption and production which means we are avoiding waste and we are looking at the future, our generations, what we leave for them. We talk about direct, direct and indirect climate action. We are concerned about life below water and life on land. So these are some of the 
very clearly articulated concerns uh, which are captured in the sustainable development goals. Now, how does the idea of green economy uh, you know, appear to Islamic scholars, to appear to Islamic economists? Can it be the, a policy goal or can it be a societal goal when you talk about Islamic societies? Of course, we have to see what are the Sharia perspectives on the idea of environmental protection and the idea of, you know, idea of uh, being concerned about the future. But here we have the, uh, you know, scholars, they talk about a framework, which is called Makasit Sharia. Now this framework is uh, from an academic point of view, it is very, very appealing because uh, it can, you know, set a very clear direction to our discussions and deliberations to our policy formulation process, especially when it concerns Islamic societies where uh, the nations are dominated by uh, Muslim population and who are concerned about Sharia and the various dimensions of Sharia, they must be clearly reflected in our day-to-day -day lives. We know that the religion of Islam sets the agenda for development in predominantly Muslim societies, it is expected to. And it is therefore it is very interesting to examine. And some scholars have already been into it in a big way. You have a lot of publications already in a literature where which basically try to map the SDGs onto the Makasit Sharia and vice versa. And they have sought to examine to what extent the SDGs they conform to the Islamic vision of development. One of the earliest Islamic scholars to really talk about the Islamic vision of development. Uh, at the turn of the century or uh, around the time uh, was my uh, uh, mentor and colleague, uh, former colleague, Professor Umar Chapra. And many of you might be well aware of his work. I don't think there is any Islamic economist or a student of Islamic economics who is not familiar with his work. And his uh, famous work, Islamic Vision of Development, uh, though he wrote at a time when the SDGs were not being talked about. It was perhaps the Millennium Development Goals, which were, uh, you know, under focus. Now, in his uh, very short, uh, uh, I would say, a monograph on the Islamic vision of development, he has done an uh, extensive mapping of uh, the various ideas of uh, and the notions of, uh, you know, development and how they are uh, taken care of in the various maqasit. So the Islamic vision of development, he basically starts with the maqasit sharia framework. And uh, of course, he has extensively debated, uh, deliberated upon that. And I would uh, urge all of you to get a copy of uh, this monograph. It's freely available on the internet for download and take it and uh, seriously go through uh, the ideas that he brings in there and the idea of mapping one to another and being able to see how there are common goals to be achieved in both Islamic and uh, I would say secular societies and non-Islamic societies where Muslims and non-Muslims live together. And these, there are, uh, when, you, when you do the mapping, you are very clearly identifying the areas of common interest. That is where you have, uh, you know, you have, uh, you are avoiding uh, any possibility of a conflict between the frameworks, and you can uh, perhaps proceed as one unified framework. Now, these are the five uh, broad categories as we understand the five makasit, as we all know. We have the uh, you know protection, and uh, that's the classical uh, scholarship focused on protection. Uh, uh, the modern scholars, Islamic economists, including Dr. Chapra, they move beyond protection, talk about enrichment, you know, how you enrich, not only protect, but see enrichment as a clear goal by itself. We all know that enrichment is, of course, a, uh, you know, directly related to protection itself. You can't protect anything unless you develop it, or unless you enrich it. And it's very much discussed uh, in the context of Aukaf. We have the problem of decaying or disappearing Aukaf property. And we are concerned about protection and preservation. But if you look at what the modern scholars say, development of our property is 
the surest way to preserving them. So if we go by the idea that we allow them to, to lie as they are, you know, we don't touch them, then that is, that is the surest way to facilitate their decay over time. They will disappear over time. And that is what has happened when in, unfortunately in many countries that a societal focus only on the preservation. And if you overemphasize this aspect without looking at the enrichment, then you run the risk of losing the endowment itself. So uh, this, uh, this also, uh, this goes without saying that if you're talking about protection, you're also talking about enrichment. So if we're talking about Dean, then we are not just talking about protecting our Dean, we are talking about enriching our Dean through Dawa and other efforts. Similarly, we are talking about uh, protection and uh, enrichment of self, nafs. We are talking about the protection and enrichment of intellect, or akal. And also we talk about progeny or posterity and nasir. This is where the, I have uh, sort of uh, put a green, mar uh, green marker on it to clearly identify that as the area of focus because it talks about future. Area of focus for the green economists. This is where the Makassid is, is, is clearly taking you to the future and to, taking you to the uh, future mankind, our, uh, the generations to come. So we have to leave a healthy planet for them. We have to be responsible in, in our consumption and production, avoid waste. So this is all, uh, all these ideas are kind of encapsulated in this idea of uh, preserving and enriching our progeny or our posterity. And of course, finally, you have the uh, you know, protection of mal or the property. Uh, you have the various uh, Sharia nominate contracts, uh, the, 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 the rich theory of contracting in Islam. Essentially, is, its objective is protection and enrichment of property. As we know, if we don't have this, uh, you know, the idea of ownership of private property, that will go against the very idea of preservation and protection of property because we will be losing our incentive mechanisms for creating wealth. That is why this is one of the clearly articulated goals in Sharia and by our Sharia scholars. So moving on, moving forward. We now take a look at uh, you know, the idea of uh, a green economy. Uh, I'm sure those of you who have uh, tried to browse through early Islamic literature Perhaps, perhaps the idea of a uh, you know, green and sustainable economy is not explicitly uh, discussed or uh, as uh, this present generation of uh, Islamic economists, they, 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 they are concerned about this, this aspect of Makassid. But then, uh, you know, the, the very idea of the climate action is, uh, is kind of new to our generation. Perhaps the earlier generations didn't quite realize that what kind of harm we can cause to, for our future generation by through our irresponsible consumption or irresponsible production. Or unless we take proactive steps for climate action to reduce the climate risk, the whole idea of climate risk was perhaps not fully understood by our earlier generations. But now they are becoming more and more important and that is why we need to very clearly underline, you know, what the primary sources of Islamic law or Sharia or the Quran and the Hadith, what they talk about the environment and what they talk about the greening of the economy and the society. Now, so I'm just putting the uh, related, the relevant SDG at the top left, you can see that it is SDG 12, which talks about ensuring sustainable consumption and production patterns. Now, what does Sharia have to say about it? What are the Sharia, uh, you know, uh, 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 if we can quote from the Sharia, in what way we justify these as goals to be sought by uh, Islamic nations? Now, we see the Quranic verse very clearly, you know, talking about avoiding waste and avoiding excess because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves not the wasters, not the people who engage in, you know, excessive consumption or any kind of excess. So this very idea of uh, responsible consumption and production comes from Quran itself. And of course, 
one can write, uh, you know, one can talk hours and hours on this. Uh, but what we see a very clear match, what Sharia wants us to do and what our policymakers across the globe, they have uh, deliberated and kind of agreed on this as a clear policy goal. So we try to move a little faster here. Uh, we have the SDG 13 climate action, which says take urgent action to combat climate change and its impact. So I don't have to uh, read it, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, point point by point. Uh, you can see that, you know, we have uh, uh, the the Sharia, what it wants from us, how it looks at upon human beings as vigilance by sharing of God, entrusted with the earth or the planet itself. And we have the mission to faithfully observe the values given by our creator. We have a short life during which we have to utilize the scarce resources of the planet, planet as trustees. So each one of us is a trustee of the planet, the resources that are available on the planet. And as a trustee, we are not supposed to, we are supposed to be very, very careful when we are using, utilizing these resources. And then when we interact with each other, we must do it in accordance with the rules as prescribed by the lawmaker, the lawgiver, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and have a responsibility towards ensuring the well-being of all humans. And this responsibility not only includes humans, but also protecting the environment, including animals, birds, and insects. Then SDG 14, uh, we find a Quranic verse very clearly talking about, or uh, uh, very clearly refers to the perils of putting the planet at risk due to irresponsible human action. But it does talk about a possibility, corruption death appear on land and sea because of the evil which men's hands have done. So human beings will bring in this kind of corruption will bring in, will engage in this kind of responsible action. But this is what Sharia wants us to, wants to prevent, wants to stop, put a stop. So essentially we are all, uh, uh, you know, uh, exhorted to conserve the resources and to use them, keeping in mind our future generations. Similarly for uh, SDG 15, we are talking about uh, life on land, sustainably manage our forests, combat desertification, halt and reverse land degradation, and halt biodiversity loss. This is very clearly articulated in SDG 15. And we have uh, the, the importance of you know, planting a tree, the, plant, the very importance of the significance of afforestation uh, this very simple hadith, you know, so clearly underlines, so clearly underscores the importance of this, which says that if the resurrection, Yom al were established upon one of you while he has in his hand a sapling, a small plant to be planted, then let him plant it. So this, this, I mean, I, I don't think it requires any further explanation or elaboration on how important planting of a tree is perceived, what role it has, it, it, what, role, what place it has in the overall scheme of the Sharia. If Hadith is very clearly directing us to plant it, uh, you know, the sapling that we are holding, even when the day of resurrection is established, I think there's nothing more serious than the establishment of the day, day of resurrection or the day of uh, Yom al So even then we are exhorted to plant a tree if we have one. And similarly, uh, it is uh, very clear how these uh, are there, which basically uh, tell us that planting of a tree is regarded as an act of sadaqa jariya or continuous charity. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Okay, uh, again, so 15 and 16, they talk about environment. So we know that you know, uh, the Quranic verses that uh, you have before you basically reinforce the scientific concept of the chain of life, the idea of interdependence among species, the idea of dependence of humans on plants, on insects, on uh, birds, and vice versa, and maintaining the importance of maintaining the balance of life on earth. 
So these are some of the references which basically uh, tell us uh, the, you know, the importance of uh, the environment, the importance of the planet, and how uh, Al-Quran itself has very clearly underlined in different verses after verses, the, 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 the rationality and the reason behind uh, you know, observing measure. We cannot uh, engage in excesses whenever it comes to uh, you know, consumption of the resources or the utilization of the resources. Therefore, the maintaining the balance of life on, on a planet is a supreme duty of humans and therefore forms part of the divine objectives of the Sharia. Now, coming back to the SDGs again and uh, the Makasit the Sharia, uh, this is the next section that we'll be talking uh, about, uh, discussing about, which is uh, we are bringing emerging technologies into the, into the picture. Technology is a way to achieve things more efficiently, more effectively, having a greater impact, uh, taking care of pain points, addressing tensions, wherever there are difficulties, challenges, getting rid of them through technologies. And the emerging technologies are just about that. They help us to address the tensions in the economy. They help us address the pain points for the participants in the economy. And uh, we are going to see how they are, they also help achieve not only the SDGs, but also the Mahasata Sharia, especially when it applies to uh, the idea of uh, the idea of sustainability, the idea of uh, greening of the system. So we are talking about here, uh, as we know, the SDGs, they involve three dimensions of sustainability, economic, social, and environmental. Similarly, we have the uh, Mahasata Sharia, talking not only about the people, but also about the planet, not only about the nafs, but also about nasal or the future generations. So moving on from here, we will be focusing only on the environmental aspects. We will uh, ignore the, you know, the individual aspects or the social aspects, but we'll focus more on the environmental and economic aspects. And here we will see what are uh, the benefits uh, of bringing in these uh, new technologies like a blockchain technology, uh, big data and artificial intelligence, internet of things, immersive technologies like augmented reality, mixed reality and virtual reality and, uh, and all of the new computing paradigms. You know, they are uh, every other day we hear about further developments in these fields and how they can help us in not only uh, in, in achieving our Makasat Sharia and SDGs as they pertain to, uh, you know, the, the environment, uh, but also what are the challenges they create, you know, they also create some new challenges. So it's that uh, the use of technology is not a, you know, is not a, uh, I would say, one way game, there are also things, uh, risks, uh, along with the, the benefits, uh, which is always there are two sides to the coin. So we have to see, uh, as we uh, engage with technology as a solution or as a driver of uh, our uh, uh, goals uh, or our progress towards achieving these goals, what could be some of the risk factors? And I have very briefly spoken about uh, or underlined a few ideas here. Uh, they are still not fully understood. The idea of heterogeneity, the idea of autonomy, the idea of interoperability and scalability, when it, these are all related to technology, use of technology, like interoperability, takes some time to explain, for example, uh, we are using a specific protocol like, uh, you know, a platform based on Ethereum. And uh, we are talk, uh, talking about another, uh, you know, application being developed in Algorand protocol. Now we are now talking about our metaverse that sits on Algorand and other metaverse that sits on Ethereum. Then we have the problem of interoperability. We are yet to find solutions, enough solutions, which allow people to uh, operate as if they are part of a single metaverse or a single world. You know, each one of them, because it is using a different uh, protocol, it, is, uh, it has a different world by itself. So we are, of course, our developers community is basically moving towards uh, addressing this challenge which this technology brings in, which is to make them interoperable. 
that if I'm a member of, uh, uh, let's say, one Islamic metaverse, I should also be, uh, you know, it should be possible for me to get into the the, the original meta or the, the metaverse, you know, uh, brought in by the founder of the Facebook. So these are all, uh, you know, different, uh, I would say, uh, as they exist now, they're different worlds, they're different systems. They're heterogeneous systems. They're not homogeneous system that you can, you have, uh, you know, one uh, technology that basically, uh, you know, is used to design all the applications. No, you have very wide range of applications being developed using different, uh, you know, technological platforms or protocols. So that is why, and you have the scalability problem, like you start with a small metaverse, for example, a small world or a small platform uh, comprising, uh, let's say, uh, donors and uh, donees belong to a small locality. So you have, you know, at most 1000 members of your uh, network. But then what happens if the uh, size of your members grows to, uh, you know, 1 million tomorrow? Will your platform be able to handle that many transactions, that many donations? This is a big question. That this is the scalability issue, that you should be able to scale up your solution. So every solution has a its own parameters when it comes to its own scale. It can handle certain amount number of transactions at a time. We have we frequently hear about crashes taking place. For example, suddenly a platform becomes highly popular. You are certainly going to see it you know, going crashing because of too many transactions. So if, if the scalability dimension is not carefully planned right from the start, and of course, everything comes at a cost. So if you're talking about a proof of concept or, or a small experiment, certainly scalability you have to keep in mind, but then uh, this is the challenge that you have to face. So uh, of course, these are uh, challenges not without solutions. As I said, the developer community, and frankly, I do not understand much, except uh, uh, perhaps a layman's understanding of uh, the challenges. The real challenges are confronted by the developer community, the, the, the technology experts, and they're finding solutions. And uh, of course, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a pleasure for us to see them developing, coming up with solutions day after uh, day. And, uh, uh, these are uh, some of the challenges that are currently under focus. And of course, we have the additional cybersecurity risks, where the risk dimension, the security dimension has to be part of the design itself. You know, you cannot develop or invest huge amount of resources, develop a platform, and then it goes crashing because of a attack. So security risk is something that is very clearly on the front burner for uh, the startups which are, uh, you know, uh, coming into the ecosystem uh, every other day. And these are the risk factors that the challenges of tomorrow. But we are not here to discuss the challenges. We are basically looking at the potential of these technologies in meeting some of the unique challenges of Islamic social finance and then further narrowing the focus to environmental. Uh, protection and nurturing. So let's move on. Let's see what these technologies have to offer to us. And I'll just focus on uh, uh, the blockchain technology. Uh, we simply don't have enough time perhaps to uh, to move into the techno other uh, technologies. And in any case, they are yet to you know uh, make a big appearance or make a big impact as far as the social finance is concerned. Uh, so let's uh, focus on blockchain, uh, which is one of the key enabling technologies that can help create sustainable and secure solutions. These are the, some of the uh, clear benefits or clear features, you can call it them, of uh, this technology. Uh, of course, it is uh, a decentralization. It, it's based on the idea of decentralization. We, have, we are no longer happy with centralized databases, which can be tampered with by you know, the, the admin, the admin uh, of that database. Because data is uh, gold, as they say, or data is oil, like it's a very, very precious uh, resource. 
and uh, there's a lot of uh, you know sensitivity about sharing of the data. There's a lot of sensitivity sensitivity about tampering of data. Therefore, uh, blockchain is seen as a solution because it is based on the very idea of decentralization. That one bad actor simply doesn't have a way to tamper with the data. That is why we have the consensus mechanisms, which are inherent to the idea of blockchain. That we need to build a consensus and there are different ways of doing it under different protocols. So again, as a non-technology guy, I'm not taking you into those ideas. We are looking at how these features, they help us solve our problems. And if we see ourselves as, let's say, Islamic economists or students of Islamic economics, what are our problems? And what features of this technology can really help us address those problems? One just I said as decentralization, which can prevent us from tampering of data, for example. That is why suddenly we are talking about you know, blockchain-based currencies, transactions. Why? Because every single transaction on the blockchain, you know, it can be, can't be uh, tampered with. You have full transparency about these transactions, immutability of, about these transactions. Once you agree to a contract, for example, we have uh, Sharia prescribing two witnesses and uh, other features of a standard contract that you need to write it down, that the different features of the contract, you need to, for example, a sale contract in order to be Sharia compliant has a range of requirements where the object of the contract must be, uh, must be known and uh, the terms of delivery must be known, the price must be known to avoid you know, the problems of gharar or uncertainty or jahal. Uh, it should be free from riba and so on and so forth. So these are some of the requirements you know, that make it a Sharia compliant contract. Now, uh, uh, why, do we, uh, how, why do we require witnesses, for example? Why do we have to write it down the contract as Sharia requires? Because to make it, uh, you know, to, to ensure it against bad actors. For example, tomorrow the party, if you just do a verbal contract, for example, the other party simply says, or simply forgets, or simply refuses to acknowledge what recourse you have. This is why we, we have the you know, system of having witnesses. Now, what is happening here in the context of blockchain? If you do a contract and put it on the blockchain, now no one can tamper with it. Not a single, you cannot befriend a one bad actor and somehow influence him to change the terms of the contract. It is simply immutable. That is why we have a very clear uh, use case of putting our Okaf deeds on the blockchain. Because Waqf deeds is a serious problem with the Okaf sector that a lot of our deeds are simply lost. We have lost track, track of uh, those uh, endowment deeds. And today we don't know, we have the Okaf property, but we don't know who was the Waqf, who, was, who are the beneficiaries as intended by the Waqf and what areas in which uh, you know, the Waqf benefit should flow. These are all part of the Waqf deed, which itself is lost, unfortunately. So we have no uh, recourse, perhaps to find another you know, quick solution, either to uh, kind of socialize the whole thing, transfer it into the hands of the government and our government agency, because we don't have the Waqf deed, which is the primary instrument of the institution of Waqf. And they have been destroyed or they have been, because when you are talking about once a Waqf, always a Waqf, of course, we are talking about uh, moving along on the time machine way into the future, decades and centuries into the future. Nothing can destroy a waqf. Then in that case, our waqf deed should also be indest indestructible. If tomorrow it is just you know, destroyed by ants and uh, termite, for example, or there is a flooding of the premises and it's gone, if it is written on a piece of paper. That has happened, unfortunately. We see, you know, uh, we have lost uh, many of our Okaf endowments. And that is why the whole Okaf sector is either you have too much of regulation or you have very little regulation, free for all, because the Wakf is simply, you know, conspicuous by its absence. 
And here is a solution. And uh, you put it, uh, you make a VAC and the VAC puts it on the blockchain. Technically, it cannot be destroyed. Technically, it cannot be tampered with. Technically, people cannot plead ignorance that we don't know this because you just have to, you know, use that uh, protocol, go to the platform and see it for yourself. That the document would be there or the transaction is there, whether it is a work donation or any other transaction for that matter. So therefore you have what we now say smart contracts. Smart contracts are auto executable contracts. They execute by themselves. So you don't have to bring in uh, a, a police constable to execute the verdict of the Qadi or, uh, or, or the judiciary. You don't have to have other uh, you know, trust agents, trust inducing agents to get things executed. Here you have a smart contract, you have a lease contract, for example, a Jara, which gets executed automatically. You, you cannot enter the premises, you have not paid the lease rentals in time. We need, of course, internet of things, which automatically shuts down the doors for you. And you cannot open it unless you make the required payment, which is again, can be automated. But if you, let's say, through some uh, intervention, you are able to you know, stop the payment, then you also lose the leasing rights. So these auto-executing contracts make it easier for the, the entire, you know, they're very much in line with Makasita Sharia, which talks about protection and nurturing of mal or the wealth creation process. You have now uh, foolproof contracts, we call smart contracts or foolproof contracts, they execute by themselves. And you have, of course, uh, traceability, which is very, very important. Now we talk about, uh, uh, you know, uh, of course, I'm slightly moving beyond uh, the traditional definition of social finance. But then these are societal concerns of, uh, let's say, uh, tampering of halal certification, or tampering of, uh, or uh, I would say, uh, not taking the required precaution along the entire supply chain of a halal food item, of halal meat, for example. We can inspect the premises where they are being, you know, the, the slaughter is taking place and certify that, yes, the process of slaughter is, slaughtering is halal. But we have no idea what happens after that as it moves through the warehouses, whether the containers they provide for halal and haram need to be put together, how they are packaged, how they are shipped and how they reach uh, the warehouses, the malls, and finally on the plate of the, the customer or the, uh, the customer thinks that, well, uh, I see the halal certification, uh, it is there. It is, when I purchased, I saw the certification, so the meat must be halal. But the point is we have left out many points of contamination where haram, elements can contaminate our so-called halal food. So this is where your traceability is very, very important and blockchain uh, is already being applied. I know in Indonesia, there is an experiment uh, for halal certification using blockchain for poultry meat. People have started using these technologies because they see the benefit of tracing the entire value chain, the entire supply chain, how it moves from the hatchery to the plate of the final uh, customer who is having a good meal. Uh, you know, uh, you can name any meal that is made of poultry. You can relish that only when, if you are a faithful and deeply religious person, you can never enjoy your meal if you are not 100% satisfied about its halalness. If I tell you that there's a lot many points you are leaving out while you give your halal certification uh, where there could be contamination possibility, then of course, you'll be worried. You have reasons to be worried. That is where we say that blockchain brings its many, many benefits because it is decentralized, where it cannot be tampered because it is immutable. Nobody can alter the data. Nobody can change the nature of beneficiaries. Nobody can, you know, uh, uh, claim ignorance because it is transparent. It is visible to the entire planet, all the inhabitants on this planet. If they want, they, can, they just need an internet connection and the right link.
to be able to see that the transaction has indeed taken place. It could be a donation transaction, it could be a sale, it could be Jara, it could be anything. And then traceability as the object of the exchange, for example, if it moves from one point to another, or for example, in humanitarian assistance, we know this is a big problem of leakage. When we distribute our zakat, our zakat officials keep talking about this problem that you never know whether the people who are receiving your zakat money, they're genuinely uh, needy and poor. Who is going to certify that? They could be you know, needy and poor maybe last year or when you came to distribute zakat. But today their uh, you know, financial conditions might have changed. But who is going to keep track of uh, who is a genuine, uh, you know, uh, receiver of zakat, mustaiq, and who is not. That is why traceability is very, very important. And we are, we are supposed to, as uh, zakat givers, we are equally concerned with, with the rest of the stakeholders in the, in the zakat system as to uh, the traceability of the beneficiary, the traceability of every dollar or every ringgit or every rupiah that we pay as zakat, we must know where it is going. And that is where again blockchain can help us. Okay, I think uh, we are, uh, we have to move for a real fast now. Uh, I see uh, the clock ticking away. Uh, now here is one. This is a beautiful, uh, you know, it's a beautiful uh, slide. I would say. Uh, please uh, take a close look at the different, uh, you know, sections of this. And I don't have to again read it out to them. They tell you in one slide. Uh, uh, this taken from Intech Open from a monograph published by them. Uh, which basically talks about uh, the beauty of the slide is that it brings in one place. Uh, there are, it leaves out certain things, but it's a very good collection of use cases vis-a-vis -vis sustainable development goals. How the various features of the blockchain that we just discussed, they make it possible to achieve the different uh, you know, SDGs. For example, if we're talking about no poverty, you can see at the right uh, top corner, it talks about financial traceability, humanitarian assistance. So it talks about traceability of the dollar or rupiah that we give. It talks about the traceability of the beneficiary. And uh, the efficient access to credit. We have the idea of digital identity. You know, many of our people who are uh, unfortunate, we, we, we call them uh, internally displaced persons or refugees who are, who have because of natural uh, circumstances or warlike situations, internal strife, they are forced to leave their homes and they're forced to leave elsewhere. And we try to help them out, but they have no identity documents. And most of them perhaps, unfortunately are like that. They might have lost their identity documents when they left their homes or their homes were flooded or destroyed by a natural calamity. And we are here to offer them humanitarian assistance, but we don't know who they are because they have no identity. Therefore, uh, the idea of digital identity has been used and this is a direct application of the blockchain technology that you can give digital identity to each one of them whom you want to benefit. And you can exactly keep track of how the benefits are going to be passed on to the intended beneficiaries. Similarly, you, you can see that different features of uh, uh, tamper-proof nature of this or immutability or traceability and so on and so forth transparency, these are being used in achieving different SDGs. For example, you're talking about quality of education, you want to improve, then you can have use novel learning approaches. You can use metaverse for learning, which can make it very, very exciting for the students. You can uh, use blockchain for preserving the educational records and certificates, for example. So with one single link, your employer will know what qualifications you possess or what skill uh, skills you have and can make an online offer without uh, uh, you know, taking further hassles and asking your university to send a copy or a, or, or a, let's say scanned copy of the paper document. No. So there are many ways you can use the blockchain technology and uh, AI for achieving the SDGs. So this is a slide you need to revisit again. Okay, now coming to the greening, green part of it, uh, again, these are uh, we know energy consumption is a big issue with proof of work protocols like Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, version one. 
But now uh, we, there is a move towards moving to uh, you know, uh, alternative protocols like Algorand protocol, which claims to be the uh, you know, first made in carbon neutral protocol, uh, where uh, basically the carbon, they're a carbon negative uh, protocol basically, because they make conscious attempts to uh, make carbon savings, which more than uh, compensates for the, uh, for the carbon they create, for the carbon footprint they create. And we have examples of, uh, but uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that even though some blockchain protocols like Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum, they are criticized because of uh, the damage to the environment, because of an enormous amount of electricity they consume. So this could be an example of uh, irresponsible consumption. And uh, though they are criticized, there are alternative protocols which are coming up, which do take care of uh, such concerns. Uh, especially the environmental concerns. We have these two, three examples that I have just mentioned, and uh, you can go to their respective websites. You will find a lot more information about Kickstarter and Celo, about Save Planet Earth, about uh, Polkadot, how it has been, why it has been highlighted as climate-friendly blockchain. Uh, take the help of Google search, for example, you'll find plenty of information which will tell you that why they are you know, environmental-friendly protocols. Then we talk about green digital tokens. And those of you who are familiar with tokens, I will not get into details of that. We talk about utility tokens. We talk about security tokens. We talk about asset tokens. And each one of these we, that goes with a uh, adjective of green because they do serve the cause of environment. So tokenization is now a very simplified process to those who know about blockchains. For others, you can always refer to your blockchain annoying uh, friend who can tell you, uh, help you differentiate between this. A utility token basically gives you a right to benefit from uh, being a member of a network or accessing, uh, having a privileged access to some benefits. So it can, uh, we have seen the cases of green utility tokens, which means for the members, it gives the utility in the form of uh, a reward. Let's say you are a plantation company and you're helping lowering carbon emissions. Therefore, you can receive a reward by uh, in the form of green utility tokens. And we have also seen tokenization of carbon credit itself or their biodiversity offsets, which are scientifically measured. And against each one of these, uh, uh, you know, these measures uh, or metrics, you have tokens being issued against that. We, we can call them green asset tokens. Similarly, you have green cryptos or green cryptocurrencies which are programmed in a way through smart contracts or programmed in a way that they can only be spent on green products. Similarly, you have halal friendly wallets, which basically allow you to spend uh, only on halal products. Similarly, you have green products, you have green wallets or green cryptos, which allow you to spend your uh, tokens or cryptos only on green products. And finally, you have the green security token, which allows you to raise funds to issue, to go for a you know, public issue or on platforms which are designed to enable, you know, a green proof of impact reporting. So they will ask you, the, you know, they will require you to, to show, to demonstrate the impact you are making on the environment, the positive impact. And uh, it can be it defined in another way also that uh, a green security token basically allows you to raise resources for a project which is essentially green in nature, which is which will contribute to environmental protection. And here you have plenty of uh, examples here, case studies, use cases, where you have, uh, I've just named it without trying to explain, and uh, it will help you to really visit their respective website. You can do a Google search on these names, and you can see how they uh, some of them fall in the category of green utility tokens. Some of them fall in the category of green asset tokens. Some of them fall in the category of security tokens and so on and so forth. For example, the first one, tree coin sells tokenized assets tied to eucalyptus trees and reinvest them in. So this is a kind of asset, green asset token. And you have tokenized carbon credit for forest conservation, which is again, green asset token. You have, uh, Climate coin, which basically uh, you know awards you so-called cryptocurrencies uh, to people who plant trees or reduce CO2 emissions, 
and which can make you you can use it for on green products and uh, services. So uh, moving on. Yes, you have the uh, you know tradable carbon credits, universal protocol, diversity, blockchain triangle, which uh, are robust integrated platforms that basically guide and aggregate initiatives and carbon credit, linking them to investors and financial mechanisms. Uh, essentially, they incentivize the idea of carbon savings or uh, environmental protection or climate action. And uh, there are others like uh, who are concerned about air quality. So if you're contributing to through planting of trees, improved enhanced air quality, then you'll be rewarded through their utility tokens and so on and so forth. You, you, you can do your research and find a range of uh, you know, green uh, digital tokens, which are basically the gift of the blockchain technology. And then there's another way that blockchain has helped, uh, not only through tokens, but also through smart grid management by creating you know, uh, 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 energy grids where people can buy and sell their credits, energy credits. So this is a blockchain-based energy marketplaces where peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange of home-produced energy can be traded. So there are some, now we hear about villages which are fully, uh, I would say, uh, you know, self-reliant in the matter of energy. They create their own energy they buy and sell amongst themselves. So these are some of the examples of such uh, smart grid management where peer-to-peer -peer trading of energy units takes place, which are again, uh, you can call them, you can use tokens to capture uh, these uh, energy units. And so this, this, this could be decent, these are decentralized energy markets and which can create self-sustained uh, uh, you know, villages or uh, regions which are completely self-reliant in the matter of energy. So there are some few more examples here. Then we move on. There's another interesting idea that is of gamification. Uh, blockchain, uh, one of the, uh, you know, uh, benefits or gifts of blockchain is NFT, which is non-fungible token, which basically captures you know, it's a fungible, it's a non-fungible token and like, uh, you know, digital currencies, which can be awarded, which can be given as rewards for doing anything that is desirable by the issuer of the NFTs. These are being increasingly leveraged. So initially, you know, NFTs, of course, if you look around, if you see NFTs being used for uh, all kinds of uh, reasons, uh, for more, for entertainment, for art and so on and so forth, but they're also being used for climate action because NFTs are used for impact and carbon credits. So you have these examples of NFTs uh, being used for positive climate action. Uh, for example, you have uh, gamification to help people understand their own carbon footprint. For example, as a consumer, how much of carbon footprint you create in your daily life? Now there are such platforms which through a you know gamification allow you to calculate your own footprint. And they will also allow you to offset that by making recommendations that you can plant so many trees in your backyard and that is that will give you so much of carbon savings and that's how you can offset your own carbon negative footprint. So these are all ways to make uh, the user more conscious about the environment. And uh, this can be taken up at a micro level or even at a very, very large scale at a, at a macro level but NFTs are the latest in town and through gamification, they try to bring in uh, climate action, positive climate action. Similarly for measurement and reporting, we have uh, 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 you know, blockchain technology can be a critical tool and the massive adoption of mobile phones in developing countries, it makes it possible for solar panels to be connected to the blockchain to enable consumers to benefit from distributed generation we have uh, these examples of companies which produce low cost solar panel solutions for off grid areas in rural Africa. And we have a smart pay as you go system that makes solar technology affordable at a fraction of the price of kerosene 
allowing households to pay off solar panels. So basically make it affordable to the, uh, to, to the very poor and in the large parts of the planet, which are still not developed, but making it sufficiently uh, attractive and low cost and affordable to engage with. So uh, basically we are, uh, we can come to a conclusion that it can create blockchain, new digital economies that unite, you know, uh, that can lead to widespread positive climate action, uh, economically align people across a common purpose, and also develop economies that value climate action. Now coming to social finance, I've already spoken about Zakat and Okaf, uh, you know, as a discussion point, that we know that use of uh, Zakat and Sadaqa funds can be created for, uh, you know, free clusters. And, uh, uh, blockchain can provide digital identity, this point I just very quickly discussed, to beneficiaries in case of zakat and sadaqa and uh, uh, result in automatic flow of funds for intended use to eligible beneficiaries based on smart contracts. And you have in the field of Islamic philanthropy, uh, in the field of Aukaf, uh, the Aukaf land, uh, the development of land under Aukaf, uh, use of non-arable land under Aukaf for large-scale plantation uh, is uh, you know, can be given a push through the blockchain technology because blockchain can ensure tamper-proof and transparent record-keeping of the work deeds, this point we just discussed. It can, uh, you know, uh, ensure automatic execution of leases, for example, uh, via smart contracts and sharing of value between different stakeholders. Uh, in the field of uh, Islamic nonprofit finance, uh, first we just saw philanthropy and now not for profit finance like Kharde Hasana, we can think in terms of Kharda, Khard based microfinance programs for integrated farming and plantation. Uh, again, these Khard platforms that blockchain, that use blockchain, uh, they do the job in a much more efficient way. Uh, they, they bring in the borrowers and lenders for Khard based microfinance based on both personal guarantees and collaterals that are in the form of NFTs. So NFTs can be our digital assets can form now, uh, which are the, the, the result of, or the gift of blockchain technology, they can themselves be used as collaterals or uh, in, a, in a platform that provides Kharde Hasana uh, microfinance. In case of Islamic sustainable finance, which is a trade with modest profits, for example, uh, we are not ruling out profits, but their uh, profits are allowed because they ensure sustainability of the financing itself. So we can think in terms of output or revenue or profit sharing partnerships, salam and trade finance for integrated farming and plantation. And blockchain itself can provide a platform which can be a meeting place for buyers and investors or sellers or investees for for-profit finance. And you can use smart contracts here with that use blockchain technology for which are, as we discussed, auto executing buy now pay later facilities or revenue output or profit sharing arrangements. So these are all possibilities for a green economy. Now we finally, we come to one uh, case study. We will have, you know, uh, stop with this uh, specific case study. Uh, this is uh, IBF Net Confluence, which basically is a Islamic social cryptos platform and uh, which essentially tries to convert impact, which can be very, uh, I would say an abstract term. <laughs> But impact can be measured against specific metrics. They could be carbon footprints, ambulance miles, if it's a healthcare provider, or it could be an energy provider. You can say kilowatt hours into green or social cryptos. And this project, uh, in this project, you, you can earn or liquidate your cryptos at the platform uh, to alter your own impact score and risk return impact profile. So every investor now likes to see them, see him or her as a uh, a profile in not only uh, along two dimensions risk and return, but also but three dimensions. Uh, uh, you know, as as a as a environmental environment environment concerns investor, you are equally concerned about the impact you are making on the environment. So this is provides you a with your B two B solution, which uh, enables projects to maintain a balanced risk return impact profile in a transparent way. So. Uh, th this basically the next two slides will allow you to differentiate uh, between two different structures. 
both are green structures and both are Islamic structures. In one case, we are talking about green security tokens. You can see how the flow chart, uh, the, the flow uh, of uh, activities tells you the sequence of events. You can see that the impact donor or uh, the investor, it starts with that. He or she donates cash to the project, which is maybe a nonprofit project, which invests the proceeds in uh, or uh, the, the donations in uh, energy projects, renewable energy projects, or uh, plantation projects, or maybe healthcare provision through ambulances. So these are the assets that are being created and the benefits that are, are being created at the right hand, right, uh, uh, you know, uh, side of the diagram. You have the impact of the benefits. They could be in the form of kilowatt hours. They could be in the form of carbon savings, and they could be in the form of ambulance miles. So these are, uh, this is the flow of activities if you are trying to finance it with the green security tokens. So I, basically, I'm trying to differentiate between a security token and, uh, you know, is what we call a social crypto. This is a reverse process where uh, you are basically creating the impact first and then trying to measure the impact and allocate cryptos based on the impact. So this is a kind of, uh, I would say, uh, when we talk about uh, you know, fund mobilization, we have the funds, we raise fund, funds first and then we go on to create the asset and the benefits. In asset securitization, the reverse process happens. So what is being uh, attempted here is a reverse securitization, is a reverse process. Very similar to asset securitization, that you are actually creating the benefits first and then trying to exchange those benefits you know, through the uh, uh, to uh, those investors or uh, uh, you know, donors who want to improve their profile, who want to change their profile. So uh, you have the sequence of events slightly different where the project is first creating the impact and it is already there in the business. It is a uh, you know, solar installation it makes or it operates a fleet of ambulances or it, uh, has, it's a plantation company already into the business of plantation. So it is providing verifiable data on the impact to a third party, which is the exchange itself. And then the exchange or the platform, it converts the impact into cryptos using a matrix, which could be CO2 savings, or which could be ambulance miles, or which could be kilowatt hours. These all could be you know, units of exchange and transparent accounting with known dollar equivalent value. You can actually use dollar equivalent value or you can use the, the original matrix itself. You have the choice. Then the platform records impact on the blockchain in the form of cryptos. And they can, once it, they, they are reported on the blockchain, they can no longer be tampered with or concealed. And the platform is creating the project with social cryptos in its social ledger. So in contrast to an accounting ledger, what we call it the social ledger where these uh, debits and credits are recorded. So now uh, two parties can come in, uh, come in. One is a crypto deficit unit, another a crypto surplus unit. So a crypto surplus unit can transfer some cryptos, social cryptos to a crypto deficit unit. Thereby the crypto deficit unit can always change the nature of its crypto holdings and change the nature of the impact. Each crypto is basically uh, captures a certain impact that has already been made to the environment, a positive impact. And that is captured in the crypto. So by acquiring the cryptos, you are actually acquiring impact that is already that has already been made. So this is another uh, a variation to the earlier green, uh, you know, security cryptos. And uh, then you can see that in slide, this particular slide, we have actually uh, you can differentiate between the two: the first security token, the green security token, and another thing is the social or green social crypto. So. Uh, you have the certain advantages that are benefits that go with the second option. So these are all in front of you. And uh, uh, I think uh, now uh, it's time to, to, to pause and uh, maybe take questions.
Okay. Uh, thank you so much for Dr. Muhammad Ubaidillah. What you thought about the digitalization of Islamic social finance toward Islamic green economy has very enlightened and insightful for us. Okay. Um, let us continue the Q&A session. Oh, okay. Before that, I will remind to all participants don't forget to fill the attendance list. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's continue the Q&A session, Doctor. As you can, um, okay, okay. Um, is there anyone want to ask the questions? Maybe you can raise your hand, or maybe you can write down the question on the chat zoom. Oh, okay. So there's there are some questions in the chat zoom. First from Miss. Liatul Mutmainah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dr. Baidila, for your insightful explanation. I'm Lily. I would like to know your opinion about how can this blockchain be implanted properly by Islamic financial institutions and companies that care about the environment and in integrated manner so that Islamic financial institutions can prioritize companies that emphasize environmental concerns to obtain financing. Are OIC, can, uh, are OIC country also starting to become aware to optimizing the blockchain technology in building their ecosystem, especially in their Islamic economy? Okay, doctor, uh, you may answer first or maybe I will read the next okay. question. Uh, okay, I'll take the first question, uh, which is uh, how this blockchain be implemented properly by Islam Islamic financial institution and companies that care about environment. Now, I, I would say that uh, technology is can be used by anyone, whether they're Islamic financial institutions or uh, conventional financial institution, that is nothing. They are value neutral by themselves. The technology is always value neutral or belief neutral. And all you need to believe is uh, the inherent uh, strength of the technology, what it can, uh, what it can deliver, and what are the pain points it can address and how it can best be used. And then it's for the user to, to see for himself or herself how for the problem at hand, uh, blockchain can or cannot offer a solution. Now, uh, for uh, Islamic uh, uh, financial institutions, and of course, we have discussed a few possibilities. And uh, uh, well, uh, they, they still remain as possibilities. We are yet to see large scale adoption of blockchain technology. Uh, its uh, merits or its strengths are not fully understood, I am afraid, uh, not just by the Islamic, finance, Islamic uh, social finance community, but by even by the Islamic mainstream uh, finance, uh, Islamic financial institutions. Uh, there is, the awareness is uh, growing, Alhamdulillah, that's, that's a positive sign. Uh, but blockchain uh, is uh, something that can uh, uh, that it's 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 uh, the positives that it brings to the table. They need to be understood by the people who take decisions in our financial institu institutions. And uh, there is a growing body of literature, fortunately, which uh, documents or which uh, points at these possibilities. For example, how blockchain can be used for the Oqaf sector, how blockchain can be used for uh, you know. The Islamic charity, philanthropy sector, and the Qardiya Sana sector, non-profit non sector, and so on and so forth. Uh, we are seeing, fortunately, growing interest and excitement about uh, these possibilities. But if you ask me, show me a, a few case studies in the Islamic financial services industry. Uh, I have, uh, I, uh, you know, uh, I will not be able to do so. Uh, th there are a few. I would say work in process projects, a few projects which have just been completed perhaps, and a few that are still being discussed at the drawing board stage. But again, fortunately, we are now uh, uh, in a, in a, in a uh, place where we are allowed to think, we are allowed to see the potential. We are not constrained by what is happening in reality. And uh, uh, it, is the, uh, it is the job of researchers and academicians like uh, us, for example, we have to show the industry that here is a potential, here are the pain points, 
that you could address, uh, whether it is the Aukaf sector, whether it is the Zakat sector, uh, it is the responsibility of uh, the researcher community or the academia to take the leadership to, to identify the potential for different sectors, including in the Islamic social finance sector, and then to convince the practitioners to that these uh, initiatives will pay in the long run. And these are the pain points which can be effectively and efficiently addressed with the blockchain as a technology. But technology uh, itself is, uh, is uh, faith neutral or value neutral, I would say. Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, before that, Ms. Luli, is it clear for you or you maybe have any questions? Okay, I think that's clear. So we can move to the next question. Okay, it's from Dian Mulyakin. Thank you for a very interesting presentations about the green economy, especially about blockchains. My question is, what are the simple steps for me as a student to try to implement and contribute to this concept in everyday life so we can understand more about blockchain thing in events? Okay, maybe you can answer it, Prof. Uh, doctor. Uh, well, as, a, as, a, as a, I think you're a, uh, you a student or researcher. Uh, okay, maybe uh, Mr. Tian Mulyakin, you can uh, open your mic. Okay, I'm a student and researcher. Oh. Uh, yeah, okay, what is your question? Can you please repeat? Uh, I, ca I can see it. Uh, okay. Okay, Ms. Tian, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Tian, you can uh, repeat your questions directly. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, yeah, that blockchain is very interesting topic. Maybe this is the new topic for me. So it is a new insight uh, for me to learn about the blockchain. So maybe I need the simple, I need uh, advice uh, from uh, Professor, uh, how uh, to try to implement this kind of concept in our daily life? Maybe you can give us the ad advice as a student to uh, to understand more about this blockchain. Maybe just uh, the simple. Step. Yeah, I got your question. Thank you, uh, thank you for uh, thank you. Uh, this question and. Uh, Again, I, I, uh, I, I, my answer would be uh, to a student. Uh, and, uh, but I think before you start implementing, implementing a uh, cutting edge technology like blockchain or AI, for example, uh, you need to learn its many nuances and you need to master that, that technology itself. As a, a, as a, I would say a student of technology or even as a student of business. So as a student of business, for example, we have uh, many courses that are available in the distance learning uh, mode, which basically train you or teach you to apply blockchain for uh, finding business solutions. It's more on the application side. And this is for those business managers or senior business managers or middle level managers who are well aware of their various business problems that they, they, they come across. And then they, they, would, they study what kind of uh, uh, business problems are amenable to a good solution if you use blockchain technology. So it is not something that has to be, you know, if, if you have a problem and uh, whose solution is offered by blockchain technology, then of course, uh, you know, there's something to be learned and uh, adopted and implemented. So we see the application of blockchain in various areas. We just have, I would suggest you to go back to the comprehensive diagram on SDGs and blockchain uses. Because the 17 SDGs, as we know, they concern all of us, even as a student, you know, we see that the, uh, you know, as a, as a student or in the field of education, what blockchain can offer. Blockchain can offer you a very simple solution, as simple as placing your certificates on the blockchain 
and making it transparent to the rest of the world, including the entire employer community. But then for that, you don't need to master the technology itself. You should know how to use this technology or use a platform that is built on this technology. So we are actually covering, trying to cover many steps at a time, uh, even looking at the topic itself of my presentation, you can see that it has several components. One is the technology itself. Second, it's is impact on business as on the economy as such. And then you move on to its impact on Islamic business and finance, which is constrained by uh, the halalness of the system or the Sharia compliance of the system. And finally, you move on to uh, narrow it down further to Islamic social finance, which is Zakat, Okaf, Karde Hassan, and so on and so forth. And responsible financing, if you can include it that way. So, uh, you know, as a student, you are free to uh, you know, learn and develop yourself in any of these components. If you're a student of technology, I don't know for certain, you can focus on blockchain as a technology, which can offer uh, solutions, not just to social finance or Islamic social finance, but to a range of problems. And, uh, and the charts that you have basically includes the development problems, which uh, sort of, uh, I have included that in the presentation because it sounds a familiar uh, bell uh, in the minds of Islamic economists who are very, very concerned about development of the economy. So therefore, you see its application in various sectors, in poverty alleviation, in the field of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, reducing hunger or reducing deprivation, in the field of education, in the field of healthcare, in the field of uh, energy or renewable energy, in the field of uh, uh, building uh, sustainable cities and so on and so forth. So, uh, in short, it has an application in almost every sphere of the economy that we can think about. It is for us to master this technology and also see what good use cases we can build. The final couple of slides that I presented basically deal with some of the use cases that have been developed recently during the last year or so to cater to the Islamic social finance sector. For example, even some of them are still work in process. For example, the Akhardi Asana platform, I, I see this still as a work in process, uh, but you have, uh, let's say, a possibility of uh, Rahan-based uh, microfinance, which is, of, which, which is now a reality. And uh, uh, if you uh, uh, do a search, Google search on IBFnet, you can see uh, their applications and the, the platform itself, the multiple platforms which cater to different parts of the Islamic economy, it caters to the part of it caters to the charity and philanthropy like Zakat Sadaqa and Okaf. Part of it caters to the socially responsible financing, like uh, uh, we just discussed the you know the different SDGs, how uh, they can be uh, you know uh, better funded with the application of blockchain. And similarly, we find our use cases for for profit. Uh, responsible financing as well. So your question is, uh, uh, is, is very, very broad. And uh, I give, try to give, give provide a, a broad answer also, because you can, now you should be able to see that it can affect all parts of the society and economy. Whether you are talking about education, whether you're talking about health, whether you are talking about even entertainment. We have not put entertainment as part of uh, uh, the 17 SDGs, uh, I don't know uh, whether it can prominently figure in one of them, but I didn't see much of a literature which talks about entertainment as uh, one of the developmental goals. But then, uh, yes, people do talk about that as one of the objectives, societal objective as well. Uh, it also has, uh, and we just uh, saw the interesting slide uh, on the use of NFTs for gamification. And gamification, not just for the sake of uh, entertainment, but more to create a consciousness about environment, a consist consciousness about the green economy. So uh, you can use a technology in, a, in, a, in a various ways in uh, uh, what I would not advise you uh, would be to use them for uh, non-Sharia compliant uh, applications for gambling, for example, for earning riba, for example, and there are plenty of platforms, blockchain platforms, which 
create rebar, which allow interest based lending, rebar based lending, or uh, which are focused on gambling because they create, they're supposed to create entertainment for you as a participant. And of course, uh, we, we need to stay away from such applications. But uh, again, that, that basically uh, I cited these examples because to drive on the point that blockchain itself, that technology itself is faith neutral or value neutral. You can use it for harming your faith or to strengthen your faith. So in this discussion, we restrict ourselves to all those applications where you can strengthen your faith, you can strengthen your uh, you know, contribution as a responsible uh, player in the Islamic economy, whether at an institution level or at an individual level. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your advice, Professor. Okay, thank you. Okay, we can next to the next question. Uh, it's from Ms. Nurfala Safiriti. Thank you, Mr. Ubaidullah, for your awesome presentation. As we know, a green economy is a form of sustainability of the environment, where the environment is one of the three main focuses on SGDS. On the other hand, to carry out economic development, the government also consider economic development. As we know, economic development will be have an impact to the environment. Okay, so the question is, can a green economy be present in economic development? Then we, uh, where we can include an elements of Islamic social finance with the use of blockchain that has been echoed. Thank you. You can answer it, Professor. Doctor. Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a, it's a good question. And uh, I think you have made a lot of very, very valid points. And uh, uh, as our policymakers have uh, very rightly included environment as uh, uh, three, one of the three main focuses of the SDGs, and uh, they're uh, they're sharply under focus. And with uh, you know, as time passes, we tend to realize that. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, place more and more emphasis on the environmental aspect. And uh, perhaps our efforts during the last, uh, let's say, seven years of uh, the SDGs, you know, they were agreed upon in the year 2015, which was the first year of its implementation. And we are now in the middle of uh, this 15-year time span of uh, 2015 to 2030. So we are almost at the midpoint, and we have... Uh, it seems we have achieved very little when it comes to climate action. Uh, maybe uh, at other, with respect to other SDGs, when it comes to uh, less education, when it comes to poverty alleviation, uh, we have examples of countries which are moved, uh, moved ahead, moved forward in poverty alleviation, for example. And from uh, you know highly poverty-ridden countries, they are moved on to become. Uh, moderately poor countries and moderately poor countries have moved on to become, uh, you know, uh, uh, non-poor countries and so on and so forth. And similarly, with respect to education, healthcare, we have made significant progress, uh, you know, combating the, the perils brought in by the pandemic and uh, on education uh, field also. And there are many, many success stories that we can talk about. But when it comes to protecting the planet, uh, the concern remains. And uh, in fact, the concern is growing that our policymakers perhaps are not as uh, sensitive to climate issues as they should have been during the first half of this 15 year time period. Therefore, uh, there is a, during the last, uh, you know, the COP21 and the COP22, uh, uh, this, this is going to be sharply under focus that uh, we need, we are, we are now targeting at, you know, a net zero as our target, that bringing down the, you know, uh, the, the impact, the negative impact of uh, on climate change, uh, completely neutralize this, but it requires lots and lots of efforts. And uh, blockchain is one of the technologies that uh, can uh, hopefully accelerate these efforts and uh, I just, in my transparency, in the, in the slides, I uh, cited some of the better known uh, initiatives in this field, which try to use blockchain uh, for, uh, you know, for, for addressing the environmental issues. 
But then I will not get into your broader question whether uh, you know there is a trade-off uh, between environment and development. These are very, very broad issues being uh, addressed uh, or being uh, uh, you know by our policymakers at the highest levels. Yes, we know that there is uh, you know a trade-off, very clear trade-off. Uh, nobody wants the idea of felling of trees for or clearing uh, more and more uh, uh, you know land for agriculture by felling of trees. This is the trade-off which is very clearly you know presents itself as a dilemma before our uh, you know policymakers. And uh, the dilemma continues. Uh, we have the you know millions to feed, uh, freedom from hunger, and at the same time we have limited arable land, for example. So we need there is a trade-off. There's a clear trade-off between many of the concerns that we have, but presenting them before us uh, in in one uh, portfolio of concerns, I would say, that helps us to uh, see clearly as to what kind of trade-off uh, we can tolerate or we can be comfortable with, how many areas of uh, jungle land we can clear, perhaps how many acres we can, hectares we can clear for uh, enhancing our uh, you know, uh, agricultural production or food production. So these, these are uh, some of the trickiest of issues to be tackled by our policymakers. And uh, what we are discussing here is again, Islamic social finance, to what extent it can play the role. Uh, we have these, uh, you know, uh, thousands of hectares of Okaf land, for example. Uh, many of such, uh, in fact, according to one estimate, there are, uh, you know, uh, uh, huge tracts of land in uh, Indonesia, for example, which are non arable where you cannot grow, uh, you know, where you can uh, conduct agriculture and uh, add to food production. Now this non-arable land or uh, wakf land can always, you can grow uh, trees. One example I, I would cite is that of Green Wakf Indonesia, which is seeking to plant tamanu trees on uh, wakf land. And uh, this is a beautiful business uh, proposition where the wakf itself benefits because uh, until you come up with the plantation, it's, I would say it's uh, manfa is almost zero. The land, land remains unutilized, giving zero benefits to, uh, to, the, to the intended beneficiaries. And now you put into use, you have, let's say you plant trees, tamanu trees there, and scientists have come up with very precise calculations as to how much of carbon savings a fully grown tamanu tree can bring in, can save. Now, if, uh, and uh, they have gone ahead with putting a financial number uh, on such carbon savings. So if you have the calculation now, the arithmetic very clear that by planting one tamanu tree in a, let's say a hundred square feet of land, of wakf land. So you have, let's say, uh, you know, 10 acres of wakf land. So how many trees you can plant there and how much of carbon sa savings you can hope to aim at uh, through this afforestation exercise. And uh, each one of these carbon savings can be converted to dollars. You can find dollar equivalents of that. And in fact, the uh, uh, more developed countries, they have come up with clear policies to remunerate their farmers who basically, whose farming exercise, whose plantation exercise results in clear benefits in the form of carbon savings. And these carbon savings can be converted to, to, to cash. So uh, these are the you know, possibilities that we have here uh, in the Okaf uh, sector. We have, we know the Muslim world especially has huge tracts of non-arable land, land which is not uh, fit for agriculture, but you can have a uh, plantation of such trees uh, which can grow on uh, completely barren lands, uh, but we can still bring in a lot of carbon savings as benefits. And if our uh, the people the plantation companies or organizations can take it up in a in a in a very large scale, uh, in an organized way, then such carbon savings can be a source of recurring income, recurring revenues for such organizations. So okay. in Islamic social finance, yes, even zakat funds can also be, uh, uh, you know, used according to many scholars, though poverty alleviation remains the primary goal of. Uh, 
uh, you know, zakat as a source of funding, so as an institution of social finance. Nevertheless, you can uh, bring in the poor farmers into the equation and uh, make them plant trees, and you'll be achieving the best of both the worlds in that sense. You'll be achieving po poverty alleviation, and you'll be achieving the greening of the environment. I think that answers your question. Okay, thank you so much, doctor. And for Ms. Nurfala, is that clear for you? Or maybe you have another question? Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay, I think that's clear. And I would like to say sorry for the limited time for the answer who, an answer, maybe you can ask directly to um, doctor, maybe via, I don't know, maybe doctor, you have another um, social media or something that if uh, uh, the participant can reach. I'll just type it out here at the in the, in the chat box. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, I'll invite all of you to, to share with me your comments and uh, I value them uh, very much. Uh, inshallah, uh, you will not find me wanting in responding back. So I'll try to respond. Uh, you know, I'll just write uh, down uh, my official email. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right, so free to send your questions and queries uh, and comments, of course, I value them a lot to this email. Michelle. Okay, thank you so much, doctor. And thank you for all the answer, doctor. I think that's all the initiation for this lecture. Unfortunately, our agenda is very tight and we don't have much time to answer all the questions. And I would like to um, ask you to stay in the screen because uh, we have a small token of our appreciation for you, doctor. Uh, please accept it with our sincere thanks. Thank you so much. Okay. And once again, thank you, Dr. Muhammad Ubaidullah. And now we will hold a photo session. Please all the excellencies, lecturer and participant are welcome to open your camera and take position for photo session. Thank you so much, Ibo. Okay, maybe we give you one minute to open your camera, prepare for photo session. Give your best smile, everyone. Okay, um, the host, please help me and I will count uh, counting from one, two, three. Okay, for the next slide. One, two, three. Okay, next slide. One, two, three. Okay, move the next slide. Please hold your smile here, guys. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, one, two, three. Okay. Um, is it uh, finished, operator? Okay, thank you so much, doctor. And thank you so much, thank everyone. Thank you, thank you, all the participants. And thank you for this wonderful opportunity of sharing ideas with you. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu okay. alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Okay, but hold on, doctor. Before we close this session, is there anything else would you like to say? Maybe closing statement? Uh, uh, just that, you know, it has been a wonderful uh, uh, privilege for me to be here again. This is, I think, my third time in a row uh, you know, uh, interacting with the participants of the uh, of the school, uh, Islamic uh, Winter School in Winter Islamic course. course. Mm -hmm. So it has been a great pleasure, and uh, uh, I, I look forward to your uh, frank uh, 
and comments uh, on uh, uh, the presentation and on the ideas. And I do look forward to interacting. I promise you a reply if you write to me, inshallah. So uh, let's uh, continue our interaction. Jazakallah khair. Jazakumullah khaira, doctor. Okay, and um, once again, we would like to express our gratitude to Dr. Muhammad Ubaidullah for so generously sharing your valuable time, knowledge, and wisdom with us. We are very fortunate to have listened to what you have explained in your presentation today. May Allah bless you. And we do apologize for may felt many inconvenience from us throughout all the session. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, we have still uh, our second lecture for today by Professor Aditya Sukmana, which will begin at 6 part 30 minutes Western Indonesia time or Ba'da Maghrib by Indonesia time. So hopefully all of you participants can return again to the virtual room five minutes before the start, before we start the second lecture. Okay, from me, Alam let's close this session by saying Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin. Okay, and I'm Salma Malida as your master of ceremony. The last I say, Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Over and out. Thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, our second lecture for today is so incredible. He is a currently a professor, lecturer in the Department of Islamic Economics, Faculty of Economic and Management, I'm sorry, Faculty of, of Economics, Arlanga University, Indonesia, Surabaya. Okay, our lecturer, he has completed many research and has presented numerous paper at conference and relation to Sharia is an Islamic finance and banking. His published paper under the title of the role of zakah in Islamic social finance toward achieving sustainable finance development goals, a case study of Northern Nigeria. Okay, so we were so honored to have you with us today, Professor. However, we were, um, I'm sorry. So, um, our lecturer for today is Professor Raditya Sukmana. And before we continuing our session, uh, please allow me to ask you, Professor. Yes. Um, you rather have again a session uh, during the session or at the end of session? At the end of session. Okay, thank you. Okay, everyone, as Professor Professor Aditya Sukmana has said, all participants will be given the opportunity to ask questions after he has finished his presentation. To anyone who wants to ask some questions, you can leave your question by chat Zoom. Okay, so everyone, um, without any further ado, let's immediately listen to a presentation from amazing lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Aditya Sukmana. Time thank is you. yours, sir. Okay, thank you, uh, moderator. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin. Shadu'allah ilaha illallah ta'ala shirikala wa shadu'an Muhammadan abduhu wa rasulullah nabiya abadda. First, let us uh, thank to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salawat and salam. Let us send to our beloved Prophet Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. <coughs> Thanks for the uh, IPB as well as Basnas for inviting me in this uh, regular uh, winter course. Uh, it is uh, very nice to see you all, all the presenters, all, all the uh, participants from uh, any part of the world. Yeah. <clears throat> and today we're going to discuss about the blockchain yeah, in Wakaf. Yeah. Uh, why mm, blockchain is important? Yeah. Uh, what is blockchain? Yeah, blockchain is kind of technology. Yeah. Uh, okay, blockchain is a technology. Yeah, currently uh, during the COVID, yeah, everyone is uh, getting aware 
of the importance of technology. When you buy anything, you buy through mobile, yeah, uh, using technology. And in the near future, the use of technology is, I believe, is very much increasing, including in the social finance instrument like zakat and wakaf. Now um, we are no longer need to visit physically uh, in person uh, zakat institutions or wakaf institutions to donate our our money. Yeah, we just need to open our uh, applications uh, and then submit our donation. That's it. Yeah. No need to spend a lot of time, no need to spend uh, money for travel and so on. <clears throat> so that's why we are happy that uh, now uh, everything is by technology. Right? So it opens a wide variety of the uh, new field yeah? in the sense that um, people now are studying about information technology. Yeah, how to create, how to create a software, how to make a software, how to create applications for people to donate, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and by I believe also uh, with the advancement of the technology, the collections of zakat, the collections of wakaf, is increased in exponentially. Yeah, this increase exponentially. Now, we, we discuss about uh, blockchain right now, but before that, let me just uh, uh, review first what is the difference between zakat and wakaf? Yeah, so in terms of the status, law status, yeah, zakat is wajib, obligatory. Yeah, wakaf is a sunnah. Yeah, uh, it's not wajib. Whereas, um, if you go to Singapore, uh, the Majelis Ugama Islam Singapore uh, has been imposing uh, regulations that all Muslim workers yeah, has to pay wakaf. Uh, that's a different story. Uh, we do not want to discuss that issues in this particular uh, webinar. Yeah? But again, uh, there, must be, uh, there must be some reason yeah, uh, in, the, in Singapore. And other differences between zakat and wakaf is that in terms of recipient, yeah. In zakat, recipient is fixed, it has been stated in the Al Quran, in the Holy Quran, it's the eight asnaf, yeah. But wakaf is free, yeah. Uh, free in the sense that can a non-Muslim uh, uh, get the benefit of the uh, wakaf, of course, can. Yeah, if you if you donate your uh, money to build a bridge between one place to uh, to another place, and that bridge is treated as wakaf, let's say, yeah. Uh, can you impose a regulation that? Those only Muslim who can pass the bridge, no, you cannot. Everyone can pass the bridge. Yeah, so that's why uh, the recipient of wakaf is free. Yeah, free for anyone. And the status uh, sifat. Uh, yeah, uh, zakat is consumptive. Yeah, zakat is used for fakir and miskin. Who are fakir? Who are miskin? Fakir is the one who doesn't have a job. So fully rely on others. For example, uh, old senior, old grandma, or grandfather who lay down in bed, in bed cannot move. Yeah, and uh, other person have to to feed him, to feed her. Yeah. So basically, they rely on others fully. Yeah. So those kind of uh, persons is uh, we, we can give a zakat, yeah. But wakaf is for productive purposes. We need to maintain the corpus or the principle. That's why 
uh, it is wrong to say that uh, let's say I give a mineral, let's say I have a mineral water, a bottle of mineral water, and I say to Miss Salma, Miss Salma, I I give this bottle as wakaf to you. That's a wrong statement. Yeah, why a wrong statement? Because Miss Salma uh, drink all the bottle finish, then then it's finished. How can uh, we maintain? Uh, the principle. So it's so, so those kind of assets can be treated as wakaf. Yeah. So if that is the case, then uh, what kind of asset that we can use for wakaf? So the asset has to be perpetual, has to be able to be used more than one. Yeah. For example, I have chair and table yeah and uh, miss salma has the uh, quranic lecture for the kids let's say yeah and miss salma has the school for the kids for learning uh, quran yeah learning and reading quran for the kids since i have table and i have chairs then i can say uh, miss salma I will walk off my chair, my uh, tables for your Quranic lecture to the kids. Uh, that's a correct one. Yeah. Why? Because a chair, tables can be used on more than once. Yeah. But uh, like water, you can drink once. That cannot be used as the uh, walk off. Yeah. So that's why uh, walk off the principle has to be maintained so uh, and it, it use i mean the, the asset is used uh, tend to be a productive one yeah the meaning of maintaining is not just that you you just uh, you just leave it for example uh, after uh, miss salma received tables and chairs for me and then uh, she just put that in the storage uh, because we need because she assumed that uh, she has to maintain so just put on the storage that's it it's not like that the meaning of maintenance will uh, accommodate the issue of productive one which means that that chair and tables can also be used for some other causes which can which can generate income yeah let's say other than uh, quranic uh, lecture for the kids uh, Ms. Salma can also use chair and tables for some other causes which is profitable that can be done yeah that can be done so that's why in this case since the walk off has the element of maintaining the corpus, maintaining the principles, yeah? The, the, the existence of high uh, qualified Nazir is very, very important. High qualified Nazir. Why? Because Nazir has to, uh, to think, how can we use this Wakaf asset for the productive purposes. How? If you have five alternative for productive purposes, which one that gives you the biggest profit? Which one that gives you the biggest um, satisfaction or the biggest money that you can get? Can we uh, have the orientations of the bigger money uh, bigger profit? Yes, yes, we can. Why? Because we have Malkov Ally. Those Malkov Ally is in need of money in the in in very huge money. So that's why in doing business uh, with the concept of Wakaf, it is a business as usual. It is a business as usual. Yeah. However, once you got the money, the money is not for you. The money is for the Mark of Ali. 
Yeah. Okay. Now let's take a look at the why uh, technology is important. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the future of Wakaf. If you see on the left, yeah, Wakaf has been significantly proven in history for its social economics. Yeah. If you uh, read the story of how Wakaf uh, play a significant role uh, during the Ottoman Empire, you will see it's very significant in terms of developing the socio-economic sector in that particular time. Yeah, you can uh, the person during the Ottoman Empire will be born in the uh, hospital based on Wakaf. Yeah. Uh, and then that person, when they they are still a baby, yeah, they'll get the nutrition. How can they get the nutrition from the profit of the wakaf productive, from the productive wakaf to profit, the profit, and then it is used to buy the nutrition for babies and then give to the babies, yeah. And these babies, uh, when they grow, when they grow up. And they go to school. The school is based on Wakaf, yeah. And then uh, when they finish school until university, they go to work. They go to work in which in the company using the uh, Wakaf shares, yeah. When they married, they don't have the uh, dowry, the mahar, yeah. They can get from the pro profit from the productive Wakaf. Yeah, and when they die, die in the uh, cemetery based on wakaf. So can you imagine, from the the day he was born until the day uh, he was buried, yeah, every single life uh, he will attach with the wakaf. So it's so in significant in. Uh, contributing or supporting the socio-economic sector in that particular time. Yeah. Now, uh, if Wakaf being developed, maintenance and utilize as well, Wakaf could create sustainable benefit for the society. Yes, sustainable benefit for the society. If you read article by Prof. Murat Sizaksa, yeah, he said that if you want to help your country, yeah. Uh, try to develop wakaf. If you want to get rid of the river, develop wakaf. Yeah. If you want to get rid of the river of, of your country, then develop wakaf. Uh, initially, I don't do not uh, believe in that statement, but after I read along until finish that paper, I uh, I change my paradigm. Uh, I fully agree on what he said, yeah. Because, you know, what is the domain of the government? The domain of government is to establish the schools, right? To establish the hospital, right? To establish the infrastructure, yeah. Those all important things, basic need of the society. Government has to have money for all those purposes. But currently. In the context of Indonesia, and I believe in the context of uh, our brothers in in Africa, in Nigeria, in Malaysia, in everyone, uh, uh, in other place, the role of the Islamic organization towards the education is very significant. They donate land, they donate money to establish the schools, they donate a wakaf to establish the hospital. Whereas schools and hospitals is actually the domain of the government. But people are now replacing government uh, for those uh, basic needs sector. If that's the case, yeah, if all the expenditure are borne by government, we may have a deficit budget, right? Because the expenditure is much more than the revenue. However, if the expenditure is covered by the society, what are the expenditures? Building, building hospital, building schools, all those buildings are borne by the society. 
if every schools and every hospital are born by society by islamic organizations the budget by government uh, will be reduced if the budget by government is reduced government may have surplus budget and not deficit budget right because the role of society is very significant if the government is having the surplus budget Uh, will the government borrow from overseas loan, which is based on riba? The answer is no. Why? It's already surplus. They don't need to borrow money, yeah, from overseas, which is based on riba, of, of course, yeah. So that's why uh, a very interesting point by Prof. Murad Zangsa. He said that if you want to get rid of riba. Uh, Uh, develop wakaf. Okay, now by introducing the new technology of blockchain, it could bring a, a, a new hope for the resurgence and management asset property of wakaf, especially for the future generations. Right, the the advancement of the technology uh, in the context of wakaf is. The, the use of technology is not only for getting the money yeah now uh, many uh, youngsters yeah they want to collect money uh, using uh, social media uh, facebook instagram tiktok and others yeah they use they, they use this kind of social media to to collect the the money yeah but technology is not only used for that purpose Technology can be used also, yeah, for the governance, yeah, for the e-governance. That is important. By using the technology, it avoid many kind of cheating, yeah. It will avoid many kind of cheating. And uh, blockchain is one of the technology which is so important for developing the markup. Okay, uh, main issues, yeah, inability for efficiently utilize the assets, asset utilization, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, but I believe also in other country in Indonesia we still have a lot of idle asset wakaf, yeah, and those need very much utilization, yeah. And uh, secondly is wakaf management. Yeah, no good governance. I mean, governance we need to improve very significantly. We need to improve. Yeah, less accountability. Yeah, funding liquidity of land asset could limit wakaf. This it means that we have so many wakaf land. Yeah, but what are the things that we do not have? Is the money to develop the project? On top of wakaf uh, land, yeah, it's about the funding, and many papers have been uh, write, uh, written on that particular issues. How to fund the idle wakaf land? Yeah, and uh, innovation. Wakaf management has to look at the innovative method. See, uh, the perception of the the society on wakaf uh, still traditional traditional in the sense that what they know about about uh, wakaf is only 3m madrasa makam makam is a cemetery and masjid those 3m yeah whereas in the current environment modern environment in malaysia they offer a product called unit trust wakaf How come? Yeah, so advanced. Yeah, wakaf uh, saham or wakaf shares in the uh, bus terminal in Larkin. Yeah, so currently the concept of wakaf has been so innovative. This instrument has been in interaction with the capital market, with the shares for the equity market. With the debt market also with suku, yeah. In Indonesia we have cash wakafling suku, 
yeah and i believe in other place also uh, there are combination of uh, zakat and and not, not zakat wakaf and and suko like uh, like uh, ben collins street if you know in singapore ben collins street in singapore is developed uh, with the wakaf land yeah and the building on top of that one is uh, through uh, musharaka bonds yeah so those are the example of the uh, innovations that is uh, being done right now uh, in the context of wakaf that's why for those of you who who study wakaf i would really suggest you not to only uh, study wakaf per se you need to study capital market you need to study treasury management this is very very important yeah imagine that you are a fund manager receiving uh, hundred thousand of us dollar cash wakaf what will you do if you don't have the knowledge on the financial portfolio you don't have a knowledge on the risk management just forget it whether you leave the job yeah uh, sorry i there is a okay yeah so treasury management investment portfolio is the skill is the knowledge that you have to learn if you want to develop the cash work off and also the the shares work off right now now before i move to the how important is the blockchain let me um, start by a hypothetical example yeah hypothetical story yeah uh, i hope you can you could follow my story and at the end i will discuss uh, why blockchain is important yeah okay if you look at the figure on the left yeah there is a tailor yeah tailor is the the the, the lady who who do uh, uh, who has a sewing machine and they with, with that they can uh, create uh, or make a cloth yeah assume that uh, this tailor yeah this tailor uh, she got a problem that uh, her sewing machine is broken yeah assume that uh, her sewing machine is broken now this tailor this lady then come to nazir yeah assume that the price of the sewing machine uh, cost 20 million rupees it's about how much is that is uh, 700 us dollars something around that uh, amount yeah so 20 million uh, rupees is the cost of the sewing machine. Nazir knows this tailor very well. Yeah, Nazir knows the character of the tailors, the 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 business, everything you know. And, and and this Nazir has no problem in helping this tailor. Yeah, no problem because uh, it's already new, uh, already know. Yeah, everything. Yeah. And Nazir then create a proposal, yeah, make a proposal uh, for raising funds uh, to help this lady. Yeah. Uh, the proposal uh, is done by Nazir, and this pro Nazir bring the proposal to Wakif A. Uh, and what Nazir says to Wakif A, Nazir says that there is a lady, she's a tailor. Uh, currently, her sewing machine is broken. Uh, he has a lot of uh, orders from uh, companies to create, to make a cloth, and so on and so forth. So uh, to cut the story short, Wakif A then uh, has an empathy and give directly full amount of 20 million in the form of cash to the Nazir, yeah? Uh, 
uh, because he see what if a has a empathy to help the tailor yeah so nazir currently receiving receives a 20 million yeah 20 million rupees yeah and then once the nazir leave uh, from the wakif a house nazir a without the concern of the wakif a nazir goes to wakif b do the same thing yeah nazir said to wakif b wakif b uh, there is a tailor, she's a lady, she currently the lady is having a problem with the sewing machine. He needs a 20 million to continue her job. So to cut the story short, short uh, Wakif B has the empathy and then directly give the full amount of 20 million. Now, how much money did the Nazir give from the two Wakif uh, a and B. Of course, it's a 40, right? 40 million. Yeah. So 40 million in the form of cash is now hold by Nazir. And then Nazir will go to sewing machine shop. Yeah. To buy this particular uh, sewing machine. And then uh, the, the specific uh, sewing machine has been identified and then about by Nazir and Nazir paid 20 uh, million and the sewing machine shop will give the receipt. Yeah, it stated 20 million. Once the Nazir uh, received the sewing machine and the receipt, yeah, and um, the sewing machine is brought by Nazir to the tailor. Yeah, to the tailor. And when the Nazir give the sewing machine to the tailor, there's a picture showing that really Nazir is the one who buy the sewing machine and give to the tailor. There's a picture. Yeah. After that, uh, Nazir, as I said, Nazir received the receipt, right? The receipt of 20 million. Nazir now, what does he do is that they photocopy, yeah? they scan the receipt exactly the same color with the original one. Yeah? Scan the receipt and print two times. Yeah? He print two times. So the original is kept. Uh, by the Nazir. Now he has scanned this receipt and then uh, printed two times. And one receipt he bring Nazir, bring the one receipt and goes to Wakif A. And what the Nazir says, Wakif A, this is the picture of the sewing machine that you have donated in the form of cash. This is the picture. And this is the receipt. Yeah. So thank you very much. You are so uh, helpful. Hopefully, Allah will give you barakah. Finish. And then once Nazir leaves, Nazir, the, Nazir then goes to Wakif Bey. Yeah. Says the same thing. Wakif Bey, uh, this is the picture of the uh, sewing machine, which has been already given to the tailor. And this is the receipt. Yeah, you are so kind. You are so helpful. Thank you uh, very much. Yeah. May Allah give barakah to you. Finish. Now the question is, where is the remaining twenty million? Where? And the remaining twenty million will be put in the pocket, personal pocket of the Nazir. No one knows, right? So will that happen? Well, currently, Alhamdulillah, I never heard this kind of example, which means, Alhamdulillah, yeah? <laughs> Nazir so, so good. <laughs> but it may happen. It may happen. Why? The simple answer is that 
because in this process there is no uses of technology that is a simple answer if all, all of this operation is using the technology then it's very difficult for either one to cheat yeah so what will happen i write actually this is my writing on a national newspaper yeah uh, in the uh, in republica and actually why i write this one is because uh, before a few days before this i was in malaysia uh, attending a seminar on the same issues fuck of blockchain before the seminar i i have nothing no knowledge about the work of blockchain but after i follow i attend the seminar i learn a lot i learn a lot on these issues and then i when i came back from malaysia to indonesia then i i thought that i have to write in the national newspaper so that everyone will know so that's why i put a work of blockchain yeah uh, before i continue the use of blockchain in that particular story in that particular story of the sewing machine let me bring you to the use of blockchains in the bitcoin yeah because bitcoin is 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 a cryptocurrency yeah uh, don't get confused bitcoin and blockchain bitcoin is the cryptocurrency just like us dollar just like rupiah the only thing is that bitcoin is a digital yeah rupiah dollar is in the physical yeah blockchain is the technology to back up the bitcoin yeah so blockchain is just the technology yeah blockchain is not a cryptocurrency blockchain is a technology now i bring you to how uh, the operation of blockchain to support the technology then i go back to the uh, my example of the sewing machine now uh, this is the pro uh, process of the bitcoin if you see here there is abu and there is umar umar yeah abu uh, in his pocket in the form of digital he has 1000 btc btc is the uh, bitcoin actually like us dollar is uh, uh, is abbreviated by usd just like that rupiah rp and so on yeah umar is the seller abu is the buyer yeah so if abu and umar uh, deals with the certain goods let's say umar sell yeah, let's say sell car abu is interested to buy uh, car from umar and the agreement the price that they deals is let's say 800 btc yeah 800 btc now what abu has to do after they deal with the amount of money of 800 abu has to uh, fill out yeah fill out the private key and the public key of course this is done by computer yeah abu and umar has to um, go into the website of bitcoin to have a bitcoin and they have to agree that they are a member a user yeah so uh, once they do that abu will have a private and the public key yeah abu has to fill out yeah uh, the key public and the private the public key yeah will be recorded by miners yeah who is miners miners is actually other party not abu side not umar side yeah it's an independent party independent party yeah who will take this information so when abu is filling 
uh, the intention to buy goods from Umar in the public and the private key, yeah, it becomes the what it is called as unverified document, yeah, unverified document. Who is responsible to make that verified? It is the miners, yeah. So miners is the only entities which can verify the unverified one into the verified. Yeah. What the miners do? The miner, knowing that Abu agree to pay 800 BTC, what miner has to do is that in order for the miners to win the race, yeah, because miner is not one, so so many, yeah, and they will, uh, they will, they they are in a race, yeah, in a race of what? In a race of making this unverified document into the verified one. How? Every miner has to get the information whether the Abu has the amount of money above the 800 BTC or not. That's the only thing that the miners will do. Yeah. If the miners found out that the Abu has less than 800, then transaction will be void. Yeah, it cannot be done. Yeah. That's why uh, Abu has to make sure that in his wallet, he has more than 800 BTC. And then um, miners, they are in a race. They are not one. They are in a race. They are competing each other uh, to be the first who can verify the document. Yeah. Let's say miners, let's say, just assume that uh, the, the name of the miner is John, let's say. Yeah. John is a miner. And this John is the one who is able. Yeah to uh, verify the document. If that's the case, then uh, the 800 BTC will go from Abu to Umar. Now is in the Umar wallet, yeah, 800. Yeah. And then Umar is having the transactions with Usman. Yeah. To cut the story short, they both deal on the goods that is sold by Usman with the price of 600 BTC. And Umar currently in his wallet, he has 800 BTC. Yeah. Once they deal with the price, Umar will then fill out the data, public key and private key. Yeah. Once they do that, it become unverified document. And the miners will compete each other to be the one who can verify the unverified one into the verified. Yeah, let's say uh, another miners Ahmad. Let's say is the one who who successfully uh, uh, verify the document. If that's the case, then six hundred from Umar will go to Usman. Yeah, and all the process is like that. Yeah, you may you may ask, what is the benefit of the miners? Yeah, the benefit of the miner is that once they are successfully uh, verify the document, they will get zero point zero zero something Bitcoin. Yeah, BTC. I mean, yeah, zero point zero zero BTC. Now uh, you can Google how much the price of the uh, Bitcoin, yeah. So if you look at this picture, yeah, eight hundred is coming from Abu to Umar, and six hundred BTC is coming from Umar to Usman. Yeah. Once the deals, this eight hundred, this eight, this information will be put, yeah, and then locked in the key with the in the chain, yeah, in the chain with the, the latest transactions before this 800 BTC. 
ya. And this 600 BTC transaction from Umar to Usman, ya. Once the miner is able to verify this document, ya. And then on this information will be put after the latest transaction. Assume that the latest transaction is the transaction from Abu to Umar. So they they put a chain and then lock. That's why it is called blockchain. Yeah. Once they uh, put in the chain and then block, this information is spreaded to all of the members. So that's why in the blockchain it is very very difficult to hack. Yeah. Now is the issues of hacker and so on. Yeah. Is very difficult because what? Because the information is distributed all the members. If you want to hack, yeah, then you have to hack all of the members, which is spread it all over the world and thousand, maybe millions of the users. It's very difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult. So, what is the benefit uh, of the uh, using? The blockchain. It is a distributed ledger. Every transaction has been verified by the miners. The result of this verification will be distributed to all members of the Bitcoin. That's why to hack this uh, uh, system is very difficult. Yeah. Safety. Bitcoin is very safe since it is a digital form. If you have a physical money in your physical wallet, once your wallet is gone, your money gone. Right, but if your money is in the form of digital, yeah, in case your computer or your laptop crash, yeah, you can buy a new laptop and key in your user and password, and you can retrieve your money. Yeah, so bit benefit of the Bitcoin is very safe, and also transfer fee is very cheap. Yeah. Transfer fee. Uh, I've got this information from. Yeah, of course, it's blue link. Yeah, Bitcoin will only need as many as two point five US dollar. This is sorry, not the two point. I should uh, not the two dollars actually. This is actually two point five uh, cent dollars. Yeah, this is a cent. Sorry, not US dollar. Yeah, this is cent. So if it is sent, then in rupiah it will become 500 rupiah only. Very cheap, very very cheap. Imagine that the Bitcoin, yeah. Assume that you have a company located in US. Let's say you are a businessman and you have a company. The company is located in US, and you have to buy raw material from Europe in Germany. Let's say. You buy raw material in Europe. You ask the German guy to ship your raw material to uh, US. Now you have to pay. What else is the alternative? You go for a letter of credit, right? You go to bank and let the bank pay first, and you pay later in, with the installment. So that's the normal case. Yeah. If you want to pay a lot of money. You can go by other uh, transfer bank and so on, but it costs a lot. It's very, very expensive. But in Bitcoin, your company, which is located in the US, you just buy Bitcoin there and then transfer the Bitcoin directly to Germany, and then this guy in Germany will convert their Bitcoin in the uh, U, uh, euro, yeah, in euro, and that's it. Finish. It costs you only. Like 500 rupees and only 10 minutes because the speed is only 10 minutes. The speed is just the speed of the miners to verify, yeah. And also the benefit is the uh, the Bitcoin, yeah. The Bitcoin cannot be interpreted uh, by government, yeah. Cannot uh, not interpreted. I am I'm sorry. Intervene, yeah. It is not interpreted, but intervene by government cannot. Uh, intervene cannot be intervened by government. Okay, let's let's go back to my story about the the tailor. Yeah, 
in the context, if we use the blockchain in the context of my story about the tailor which needs a sewing machine, when the Nazir goes to the Wakif A to get the money, uh, 20 million for a sewing machine, what the Wakif A will do, Wakif A will not give cash, physical cash to Nazir, no. Rather, they go into a blockchain system and write down 20 million. Yeah. And then Nazir upload uh, 20 million, Wakif A donate 20 million. Yeah. What the Wakif A will get is the encrypted code. Yeah. This encrypted code. What is the encrypted code actually? Encrypted code is actually a code which has the amount, uh, amount of fun, uh, time, name of donors, receiver, objective, and so on. But it, it is in the form of code. You don't understand. Only the words, only the uh, big, uh, small, uh, big capital, and small, and so on. You don't understand. Yeah? So the encrypted code will record how the cash of Wakaf can be received by the sewing machine shop. Once the Wakif give, yeah, in the, the write down, the Wakif write down in the uh, internet using the blockchain, transferring the 20 million. And this Wakif A is able to trace, yeah. Uh, to trace the money. The money goes to the sewing machine or not. The Nazir, the, sorry, the Wakif A is able to do so. Yeah, it's quite similar. Yeah, when you go to the courier yeah, agency to, if you want to send your goods to other place outside your city. Yeah, once you give the goods to the courier agency, you will get the tracking number, right? And this tracking number, you can go to a website and write down the tracking number and you will see your goods now is where, where is the location right now of your goods? It is already uh, in the airport or it is already in the destinations. So similar uh, story, uh, with the blockchain. With the blockchain, the Wakif A is able to trace where will where is the locations in particular time of the uh, the money. Yeah. So of course, if the money yeah is used not for sewing machine, let's say, Wakif A will know. Yeah, Wakif A will know. And what if A will blacklist it? Yeah, will blacklist this Nazir. This Nazir is not uh, doing amana. Yeah, it's not trustable. Why? Because I give this money to buy a sewing machine. And how come? How come Nazir use the money to buy, let's say, a uh, photocopy machine? Let's say. Yeah, how come? And this uh, will be uh, blacklisted. Yeah, by the uh, Wakif A. So that is the, the, the good thing about the, the Wakif blockchain. Yeah, because it is a transparent, it is cheap. Yeah, because it um, can, can see the, the locations or the status of your money and so on. Yeah, so basically, these are the blockchain. Now, let me continue. How much time do I have, uh, Sister Salma? Five to 10 minutes, right? Yeah, okay. Why blockchain? Yeah, it, because it gives efficiency, transparency, security, consistency, yeah, uh, real time, yeah, provide transaction tracing via smart contract. This is important. Smart contract. What is smart contract actually? If you you may ask 
um, about the smart contract. Yeah, imagine that you do uh, not with technology. Of course, you will have contract buyer and seller in the form of contract. You will have the uh, the lawyer, yeah, to prepare the contract. Yeah, that is if you do manually, but in this information system era, this legal document can be um, can be treated, can be helped, can be supported by technology. Every legal issue is put under technology. That's why we call it smart contract. Yeah. Uh, so you don't need to to see in person your lawyer. Yeah. As long as the lawyer already give a signature, that means everything is, is fine. Yeah. So why Wakaf blockchain is provide unlimited sequential recorded auditing capabilities? Yeah. So this is, uh, I got it from Fintera. So basically, uh, these are the process. Step one, two, three, four, five. If you look at the step one, this is NGO, which means the Nazir, yeah, the Nazir, uh, and also the SME. The, this SME is the one who need money, yeah, and of course the one who need money has to be, you know, has to be scrutinized first, yeah, whether uh, how about the business process and so on and so forth, and then all the informations of the MSME will be put in the platform, yeah? In the platform and uh, this uh, step two, yeah? Uh, I think I go to step three first, yeah? Step three is the one who will finance yeah, the MSME. Can be individual, can be uh, entities, uh, social foundation and so on. So these are all will, is the, is the funder, is the, entities who have money yeah and they will support the msme with inside this marketplace uh, it has the the fund management the uh, asset management and so on yeah it'll support the work of board and financial auditor this is the parties yeah uh, this is too technical i don't want to deal with in deep with this one because this is the area of the IT guy, yeah. Okay, let me. I think I need to go because time is so short. Okay, uh, this is the institution will be involved. Yeah, auditor, legal body, legal body to make sure that uh, the document is uh, work of, yeah, uh, work of error free. Yeah, no error on work of, Yeah, this is work of investor who we have money. Uh, to build the, the project, profitable project on top of Wakaf land, asset manager, yeah, developer. These are all the institutions, the important institutions. Yeah, land owner giving rent to Nazir. This is the role. Yeah, Wakif, uh, Wakaf Nazir managing the Wakaf asset auditor ensure the proposal is getting accepted by Nazir. Legal body ensure the status of the land, investor fund provided, asset manager responsible. These are all the responsibility of the uh, entities to make sure that the blockchain uh, is run smoothly. Yeah, uh, this is uh, Fintara. Uh, you can uh, go directly to to the this company because not many people are using the blockchain as of now. Yeah. Uh, I only know this one, Fintera. For other things, maybe there are, but uh, currently I, I do not know because, in terms of blockchain, yeah, uh, the adoption of blockchains uh, in the work of institution space. More my conversation with the IT guy, yeah. The the adoption of blockchain is still very expensive, yeah, very expensive on the for the for the Wakaf institutions to invest, it's still very expensive. The expert, yeah, the expert is not that many, and the demand are many. Of course, the 
uh, you the the price is expensive, and also the infrastructure. The infrastructure you need to have a very high sophisticated infrastructure, which means that you need a lot of the initial investment. Uh, this is uh, yeah. So basically, it's like this. Okay, let me show you. Uh, these are the opsi, just like a marketplace actually. Yeah. Uh, if you go for marketplace to buy something, that is in the context of you buy, yeah, buy and sell. But in this particular uh, platform, it's not that you buy, but you donate. Yeah. In this marketplace, they will offer you various kinds that you can donate. Yeah, and if you see here, okay, you can okay, thing okay, this one, and uh, this is uh, RM and uh, eighteen thousand uh, ringgit Malaysia, yeah, and this in the percentage zero point twenty five percent, which means that I, 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 currently only zero point twenty five percent already donated. Yeah, still a lot of money needs to build to. The collections to for this project to run, yeah. So basically, it's like that. Okay, okay. This I think is my last slide. The opportunity is a demographic bonus. This is particularly in Indonesia, yeah, because in Indonesia we have uh, two hundred seventeen uh, million people, and seventy percent out of it is young people who is working, yeah. Demographic bonuses, increasing Islamic trend. Wakaf has been included in the several financial instruments. The challenge is about the ecosystem creations and the country is yeah. I think that's it. I I think I skip this one yeah because uh, time is so limited. I prefer to have uh, more discussions on this issue. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Back to you, Mbak Salma. Okay, Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Raditya Sukmana. What you have conveyed really, really give us a fresh insight about the concept and application of blockchain-based Wakaf crowdfunding. We are very fortunate to have listened to your presentation today. May Allah bless you. Okay, um, before we continue our session, we would like to remind all of participants to fill the list attendance in the link that has already sent on the room chat Zoom. The attendance list will be the basis of attendance assessment, so don't forget to fill it, everyone. Okay, so... Uh, we move to the next session. We now we are going to have a Q and A session, Professor. So, um, yeah, for everyone participant who have question, you may uh, use um, raise hand feature on Zoom, or maybe you can uh, chat on the room Zoom. It's pleased to you. Uh, while waiting for the participant to to ask questions, I I I want to add something yeah with regard to uh, blockchain. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> by having the blockchain, yeah, it opens very wide a new then there for the Wakaf to be in operation, in a good operation, yeah? It is not only the responsibility of the of, of me as a lecturer in Islam and economics, no. In order for the Wakaf to operation smoothly, yeah, we need a lot of uh, discipline, yeah? Including the IT, yeah? Okay. There is a question in the chat box. Uh, yes, Professor. But if you want to continue, uh, it's place for you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I will comment on that issue, but I want to continue my uh, my suggestion. Yeah, my. I do hope that all of you, yeah, if you, well, if you have kids or if you have. Uh, brother and sisters who want to pursue a uh, university level, I do suggest that uh, IT is one of the promising yeah, um, 
promising sector uh, for developing uh, wakaf. Of course, it's developing many things, but in the context of wakaf, we need people from the IT guy. Yeah, and it's very important and blockchain and maybe uh, currently there is more advanced than blockchain. That is metaverse. Yeah. So what do you know about metaverse? Metaverse is very advanced technology. Yeah. Uh, the use of metaverse, um, of course, we are currently uh, uh, right now, yeah, we are face facing the monitor in our own laptop. Yeah. Is the two dimension, yeah, length and width, yeah. But in the metaverse, uh, you are not facing, uh, you are not facing like this. Rather, it's a uh, you are not facing two dimensional things like this. We are facing three, three D, three dimensions. How we use Google. Yeah, we use Google, and I can see you, yeah, uh, as if we are in the class. Yeah, I can see you uh, as if you are in the class. Well, it, uh, I need more time to discuss metaphors, but let us continue to answer the uh, question raised by the participant. Yeah. Okay. Nihat Asraf. Yeah. Uh, okay, let, let me just read ya, Mbak Salma ya. What, uh, what is it? Uh, Nihat Asraf, what do you advise as an effective way of wakaf in minority Muslim countries where mishandling of funds is a huge setback and such countries are still very far back in terms of technology? Okay, uh, in the country where Muslim are minority, yeah, where, well, uh, in America, Muslim is also minority. In UK, Muslim is also minority, yeah. But if you ask about effective way of wakaf, yeah, then I think you should start with the what is what will be the same language that you can enter to start the discussion yeah this is the important one whenever you want to discuss with other persons make sure that if you want to discuss smoothly try to think the same language that you can discuss start with that one first yeah um Wakaf in the context of conventional, uh, they have endowment fund. Yeah, if you talk about minority Muslim countries such as America, where Muslim is minority, they have they have like kids foundations. That's endowment fund. Yeah, uh, or at least foundation. I mean, uh, do the charity, do social things. Uh, Harvard endowment funds yeah wakaf is just a domain fund the only thing is that in wakaf it has a spiritual dimension but in the context of of operations is the same whereby in domain fund the principal the the corpus cannot be reduced same with wakaf yeah once you know that there in america there is a, a harvard in domain fund you can start saying yeah start your conversations with the other parties uh, using the topic of Harvard Endowment Fund first. Because it's, a, it's the same language with your counterpart, right? Once you deal with that and try to see when you can enter to introduce Wakaf. Yeah? Uh, that's, that's how you can start your uh, discussions. Of course, uh, with the technology, well, it depends on how how prepared are we in terms of uh, capability in doing technology to support wakaf. Yeah, if we don't have enough or sufficient number of people 
who do who understand who has a knowledge in technology then prepare a scholarship ask the young people to study technology with that scholarship provided that after they graduate they must work in the work of institutions so that's the best way i think yeah because once you have the scholarship you you have a bargain yeah okay i have a scholarship i will give the scholarship to you you can enter the it you can go to the university you have to study it because this scholarship for the, for the it and also the requirement is that uh, once you finish uh, your study you have to work in the uh, work of institutions so that's one way yeah i hope it helps yeah but nihat asraf yeah and then isa hamadu considering the need of blockchain for work of management how can we deal with the issue of non regulatory framework related to digital coins okay um non regulatory framework related to digital coins before i answer this one let me just uh, inform you in the context of indonesia with regard to bitcoins yeah as i said bitcoin is a cryptocurrency yeah it's a currency but um, can we use bitcoin in the in indonesia the answer is no yeah if you use bitcoin uh, to buy goods from from mall yeah from uh, market or from shops in indonesia and uh, the seller uh, cannot also uh, price the goods in bitcoin cannot uh, once uh, it caught by a police then uh, they can be both put in jail yeah because the the legal tender now in indonesia is just rupiah yeah maybe you ask can we uh, use bitcoin to buy overseas goods well in that case um i think you can but actually uh i have to i mean i have to get some more information about these issues whether we can buy outside yeah but bitcoin now is treated in indonesia yeah bitcoin is treated uh, as asset not as a currency that's why it is regulated not by the central bank it by uh, other minister yeah <clears throat> okay let me continue okay um about the work of management uh, uh, i'm trying to answer this uh, isa hamadu uh, non regulatory framework related to digital bitcoin digital coins yeah well i think the idea of uh, work of management with the uh, with connection of digital coins i suggest that the player in the this issues yeah uh, in the work of institutions who wants to offer uh, digital coins yeah uh, should get the view of the regulators in this case uh, badan wakaf indonesia in indonesia yeah why because uh, they should know first whether what we are doing is allowed or not yeah that's the safest one we need to go to the bank indonesia as a central bank uh, who issue the currency we need to go to badan wakaf indonesia in terms of whether they allowed to um, to uh, wakaf with the digital coins yeah Uh, I hope it answer. Okay, let me continue. Yeah, Luliatul uh, Mutmainah. Yeah, thank you for your insightful explanation. I'm still curious about how is the potential of the government to take the advantage of using blockchain for the development in Islamic social finance. Is our country ready to do that? And sometimes the lacking of the social 
finance literacy, especially wakaf literacy, become one of the channels to enhance wakaf development too in some countries. Thank you. Okay. Um, when we talk about the blockchain, yeah, I know it is very, very supportive for the work of performance. However, the use of the blockchain technology is sometimes is used by, it's not sometimes, but for sure it is used by foundations of, or used by uh, its entities in the social, um, uh, social sectors, yeah? If that's the case, then uh, why should government help? Yeah, government help uh, for helping the foundations. Because foundation can raise money by themselves. They can raise money, they can buy technology, they can uh, adopt the blockchain technology. Why should the government uh, come into the picture to help the foundation? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, maybe it is better if you ask a government, why don't government use blockchain for their own, yeah, for their own uh, governance? Yeah, let's say now the regulator is Badan Wakaf Indonesia, right? Now the regulator is Zakat uh, or Basnas or regulators in the uh, social ministry. Why don't they use the blockchain? for the e-government, yeah? And give example to the people. Hey, look, uh, this all ministers, ministries, yeah, all the ministers have used or have adopted the blockchains in every single applications to facilitate uh, the need of the society, yeah? We use blockchain and this is the impact. And that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good way for the government to show to the public that once we have, uh, we adopt the blockchain system, it solves many things. Yeah. Okay, I hope it uh, helps. Yeah. Uh, continue. Norfala Stafitri. Okay, there is something that still catch my attention from our discussion tonight. Fraud, of course, when Nazir also uses money from what if B with the excess of meeting the needs of the tailors, even though what gives money already exists. This is easy to detect when we use the blockchain system. Okay, if that's a concept, what is the ideal system? Should Nazir open a new product or a contract in the work of blockchain? I mean, a different product from the required tailor. Okay, it's, it's uh, too long. I need to to think about uh, the meaning of this. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Let me read uh, once again. Yeah. Uh, fraud occurs when Nazir also uses money from Wakif Pay. Okay. With the excuse of meeting the needs of the tailors, even though Wakif man, money Wakif's money already exists. This is easy to detect. We use a blockchain. Okay. If that's the concept, what is the ideal system? Yeah, for, for me, ideal system is uh, using blockchain because um, in the blockchain, of course, when the, the tailor, the need of the tailor, of course, the Nazir will key in, yeah, will key in in the system that this Nazir is in need of money, right? And once it is uh, fulfilled by Wakif A, then it's close, yeah, then it's close. Nazir cannot offer to Nazir B because already fulfilled by Nazir A. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what the ideal should the Nazir open a new product contract? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I hope uh, I answered the question. Yeah. Okay. What else? Uh, Nurul Hudaya. From what you described, I conclude that Wakaf is needed. Uh, but we all know that our financial literacy in Indonesia is still very low, okay? I think this is an urgent issue that must be resolved. Yes, I agree. People in the suburban areas do not know that wakaf can be in the form of money. Yes, I agree, and others. In your opinion, how do you solve the literacy problem? As far as I know, the blockchain law is still debatable. Uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> The question keep moving. Okay. 
But from MOE side in Indonesia, it is allowed as long as it is used on an asset or token. The government said there is not yet. How do you see that? Okay. With regard to Sariah, uh, for to Mbak Nurul Hudaya, yeah. With regard to Sariah, the one that is still debatable is the cryptocurrency, not the blockchain. You have to make a difference between cryptocurrency and the blockchain. Blockchain is the technology, no problem. But the uh, the one which is debatable is is the cryptocurrency or the bitcoins. Yeah, that's the thing which is still debatable. Okay, the first question: How do you solve the literacy problem? My answer would be: Literacy is the responsibility of all of us, not only the lecturer of Islamic economic like me. Yeah, but everyone. In this room, everyone else, yeah. Those of the people who have nothing to do with Islamic economics also responsible to develop or to give literacy on Wakaf, at least to the small community, which is family, yeah. The parents, the mother, the father, yeah, has to introduce at least to their son what charity is once they understand they uh, they should introduce that charity has the two types obligatory charity which is zakat and non obligatory charity and one of it is wakaf at least to their children and me as a lecturer my Responsibility with regard to literacy of Wakaf is that I integrate with the curriculum in campus. Yeah, in campus we have Islamic marketing. Yeah, in the Islamic marketing, why don't we give chance to the student who study marketing in the class and implement how to raise fund using the theory of marketing that they receive in the class? How to raise zakat or how to raise wakaf funds? Yeah. To uh, how do we optimize the social media to raise fund for wakaf cash wakaf to help the people? We give sense to the students. This is integrated with the curriculum. Yeah, uh, and the lecturer can set. Uh, set the mark yeah that if the student is able to collect cash wakaf as much as 10 million rupees within 14 weeks or one semester they will get a uh, that's a good one so that the student will think how to get 10 million rupees within 14 weeks for the cash work off. They have to do, uh, they have to read a lot. They have to look at the target market. They have to create um, marketing strategy using the social media and they have to operate, they have to implement it. And uh, hopefully they can get 10 million. If not that they could not get A for their marks in the Islamic marketing. So that's, that's what, this is what we can do if we are a lecturer. In, in Islam, I believe many of you who are studying economics, I believe you study also the, the feasibility study, right? If you study the feasibility study or you are a lecturer for feasibility study, why don't you give the chance for the students once they know about how to do a feasibility study, give chance to them to make the feasibility study of the work, idle work of land. Let them uh, create feasibility study of certain idle work of land, whether uh, to establish the restaurant, uh, Arabic cuisine, is feasible or not yeah 
other students may do a feasibility study on the same on the same wakaf idle land yeah uh, but the second student will will see whether this empty wakaf land if we put um, uh, let's say shop mini mini market yeah supermarket it is feasible or not yeah so those kind of of possibility can support the literacy yeah in the context of Indonesia, for your information, we have 700 study program in Islamic economics and finance. Can you imagine 700? If each of those students is doing promoting wakaf, then literacy will be significantly uh, high. Yeah, hopefully I answer the questions yeah but nurul huda ya um, um i'm sorry uh, professor but unfortunately yes. the time for organization oh. has been finished <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah sorry yeah for the those of you who raised questions i could not uh, answer all of you it's okay Thank it's you. okay or yeah. maybe uh professor you have um email or social media that participant can reach and ask the question directly to you yeah i you you just state my name in the youtube i have some videos on wakaf you just type my names on the youtube and um, you will know okay okay thank you so much professor for your answer to all questions and i believe that we have been exp uh, that what have explained for uh, from you has answered. I'm so sorry. I believe what have been explained by Professor Ditya Sukmana has answered all the question very clear. And I think that's all for the Q&A session. Professor Ditya Sukmana, um, let's move to the next agenda. So I would like to ask you to stay on your screen, Professor, because uh, we have a small token of our appreciation for you, please accept it with our sincere thank you. Okay, uh, once again, thank you, Professor Aditya Sukmana. And now we'll hold a photo session. So for all excellencies, lecturers and participants, we are welcome to open your camera and take position to have a photo session. And please give your best smile, okay? Okay, so host, uh, I'm sorry, can you show the certificate, please? Okay. Um, so now I will count from one, two, three to take a photo session for the first slide. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, for the next slide, one, two, three. Okay, next slide, one, two, three. Okay, um, I think there is no one on cam on another side, so yeah. Alhamdulillah. We can move to the next session. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Before we close, we would like to remind all of participants that tomorrow agenda we will start the same time as today, at four o'clock in the evening, Western Indonesia time. Tomorrow we are going to listen to Professor Habib Ahmed, who will deliver a lecture on Islamic social finance, Zakat theory, and Mr. Bondan Margono on Islamic insurance, social finance approach in risk mitigation. We would also like to remind all of participants about the assignment, the post test. Please kindly check your account at the website of cwipb.ic.id using your username and password. Okay, and we would like to express our gratitude to 
all your distinguished lecturing lectures today, Dr. Muhammad Ubaidullah and Professor Aditya Sukmana, who have shared their valuable time, knowledge, and wisdom on today's lecture. We will also like to express our gratitude to all participants who have attended our lecture today until the end. May Allah bless all our activities today. Also, we would like to ask your forgiveness as you many felt may convenience inconveniences throughout all session. So, Wallahu alam bisawam. Let's close our agenda today by saying hamdalah, alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin, dua kafarah majelis. And I'm Salma Maulida as the master of ceremony for today. And the last I say was Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for your enthusiasm. See you next time.